<clears throat> All right, welcome to our July 2nd, 2020 Club Cubase Google Hangout. We'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. I'm going to do a quick audio test on my end, and we'll uh, get let people get logged in. So just bear with me for a minute. And I'm, okay, so it looks like audio is coming through. Okay. Um, so this is a, basically, if you haven't attended a Club Cubase Google Hangout, my name is Greg Undo. I work as a product specialist for Steinberg Products uh, for Yamaha Corporation of America based in the United States. I'm uh, broadcasting from outside Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, how the Hangouts generally work is people can send questions in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de or they could actually um, just enter your questions in a live chat field. We usually do them on Tuesdays and Fridays uh, in the United States where I live. Tomorrow is a holiday, so that's why we kind of moved it up. Uh, a day and for the next hangout instead of Tuesday um, we're going to be doing it on Monday because I'm going to have to take Tuesday off uh, for personal things so we're going to do the hangouts uh, the next hangout on a following Monday um, so we'll be taking questions live in the chat field uh, if you're watching the event live you can feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us where you're from um, and go ahead and start collecting questions. If you're watching this afterwards, uh, we could basically, uh, you can skip ahead. We usually start about eight to 10 minutes into this as we let people get logged in. Um, so if you want to go ahead and skip ahead, if you're watching this, we'll try to have the uh, index uh, for all the topics covered, uh, uploaded tonight so that we can, um, so you can go to particular questions. Uh, so look for that in the comments field. Um, if you want to, as you enter your questions in the chat field, uh, we will try to go through as many of the questions as completely and as succinctly as possible uh, in the, so you go through in the chat area. If, uh, if we could try to refrain from asking the same questions repeatedly, it won't necessarily help um, get your question answered faster. We'll try to get the questions that were submitted in advance. Um, you know, we'll get those done as well as questions, um, you know, as they're entered and we'll get through as many questions as we can. So if we could try to refrain from a asking the same questions repeatedly, it just kind of really slows down the whole process of having to read through a bunch of questions that may have already been covered earlier. So I would appreciate that. Um, like many of you, I have uh, during our stay home era, um, I have my family at home, so I may get interrupted uh, by my son. I think he's going to be going to the pool a little bit with my wife, and my wife is also working in the house. So I'll apologize in advance for any interruptions that may occur. So I may have to step out and get a, a show or a movie started for my son. But let's go ahead and see where people are logged in from. Okay, so let's just let me go through my chat field here. Appreciate everyone being on board. All right, so we see Ted Springman from Sherman Oaks. It's great to see you, Ted. All right, so we have Ace from Texas, I believe. All right, so we have uh, British Columbia in uh, Langley, British Columbia. Okay, so, all right, so you see some questions. All right, so we have Matt, kind of regular attendee from Fort Wayne. Okay, all right, so we have Sir Robert from Atlanta. We have Pablo, who I believe is from Espana. Galicia, if memory serves correctly. Okay. Let's go through. All right, so we have Montenegro. We have Taylor from Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. All 
All right. And if you haven't uh, seen, there's currently a Steinberg promotion going on. I think it's uh, basically you can buy Cubase Artist and get Cubase Pro. Or there's uh, different discounts for updates and upgrades. So uh, I think that started yesterday. So if you've been waiting for a sale on Cubase, you can take advantage of that. Okay, so just going through some of the, all right, so we have some questions. All right, we have Pinder. Okay, so we have Sweden. Okay, so just uh, seeing, will there be other sales? Uh, I see Jay from New Haven, Connecticut says he finally got Nuendo. Will there be sales in Absolute 4, Wave Lab, and our Spectral Layer? So, you know, generally throughout the, uh, throughout the year, there's going to be promotions that kind of go on every month. Okay. All right, so we have Sweden. Right, so we have more people getting logged in. It started three or four minutes. Okay, so I see uh, Andy just didn't have MIDI through disabled from our discussions why he couldn't get MIDI to his Hallian last week. So I'm glad you got that sorted out. All right, so we have Australia. All right, so I think we have three continents. Let's see if we can get up to five. So Australia is a hard one because it's so late there. So we appreciate you being here. All right, so we have Europe, we have North America, we have Australia. I think my son is happy. He's watching the Brady Bunch currently, I think. So you may hear him kind of screaming we're happiness in the background. Okay. All right, so we have Argentina. All right, so we have four continents. All right, we need someone in Asia. Okay, so we have UAE. Kenosha. All right, so we have Nashville. All right, so my, my memory was right on Pablo's residence in Spain. This is my social, my big social outing here in our uh, COVID era. All right, so we have Miami. Good to see Ruben on it. All right, so we have India. So, all right, we have Asia. So I think we're up to five continents. Or maybe we don't have South America yet. All right, so we have Seattle, Washington. Beautiful city. Love going there. All right, so we have Colombia. All right, so now we have South America. So, all right, we have five continents. That's good. Okay, so we see questions coming in. It's good. And if you guys think that uh, Thursday is a better night than Friday, let me know. Um, I'm just trying to, you know, if this works out better or Friday night works well, just kind of leave a comment as well. We could always move. I'm trying to keep them like three or four days apart. All right, so we have Scottsdale. Okay, so we have, hello, Greg. Uh, so we have Canada, so more North America. That's good. All right, so India, so more people from India. All right, so Sweden.
Okay, so seeing comments, I think Friday is best for Hangouts. That's good. So people may be able to kind of stay home a little bit. That's fine. All right, so it's about that time. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to scroll up. I'll try to keep two timelines. Occasionally, the timelines will jump. So, okay, so it says, uh, in theory, could Cubase achieve an auto mix by calculating each channel's portion of total decibels and adjust accordingly and also account for a system of positive negative priority for key tracks? Um, I guess it could theoretically, but, you know, like I wouldn't want to necessarily say, you know, have a, you know, maybe as technology improves and artificial intelligence gets better, um, you know, there's some people that are always, you know, I, I know from uh, being in many kind of famous studio sessions with, you know, and sometimes older engineers could get criticized because they mixed uh, just looking at the meters um, our one engineer got criticized pretty heavily for a major project from by the, by an assistant that I worked with, um, saying he just mixed the meters and wasn't really you know he wasn't listening and you know what the meters said wasn't necessarily the best thing for the project. Um, so theoretically, it could be done, but I think it's going to be a long time before uh, something as subjective as a mix and levels and how that conveys to you know, um, how that conjures up musical emotions from the mix is going to be hard to do. So, you know, theoretically you could do an analysis and say, you know, this is going to be, you know, you want the vocal, a DB hotter than this track or, you know, but it's going to change. And I think it's still going to require kind of the human touch, but, you know, I'm sure we'll have auto mix stuff coming as a, you know, that'll be coming to the industry as a feature as stuff kind of improves. But, you know, a lot of stuff like that tends not to be so good. Okay, so a question from Ace. Hi, Greg. Hope you and your uh, family are doing well. We are. Thank you for asking. Uh, I have Groove Agent drums, 130 beats per minute. How do I match wave file of bass at 120 beats per minute and guitar wave at 115 beats a minute so all match project at 130 beats a minute. All right, so let's set up a quick project here. So I'll just do an empty project. Just load up a quick drum kit here. All right, so let's say we're at 130 beats a minute. And let's say when I hit play. And on this, I'm just gonna drag a couple of loops that will probably be at different tempos. So I'll just kinda, um, so let's say, I'll just see if I can find a uh, guitar. So if you wanna match a wave file bass of different tempos. So let's say if I wanted to uh, come over here, I'll just search for bass. <laughs> just search for bass and I'll just do like a quick Okay, so let's say I want to drop that in and it's tempo. Uh, when we look at this, let's see if it's. So that's not lined up. So if you know what the tempo is, really all you have to do is just place it into musical mode. And as we listen to this now. Uh, 
So once you, you know, if you know what the tempo is of the file, select the events and from the info line, just put it into musical mode. And let's say uh, if I wanted to add a guitar part on that, so let's say we're just playing here. So once it's in musical mode, then whatever I change the tempo to, so if I want to make it 108, So, and now if I want to take a different track that's at a different tempo. I could just kind of come right over here and we'll just say guitar. And this will probably be totally the wrong key, but I will Again, take this, put it into musical mode, and that will have it automatically follow the tempo of the particular track. So I could come here, and let's say I'll start with the guitar, and then the bass will come in, but in sync with the drums, whatever. So you could do that. So once you kind of just have the audio files, if you know what their tempos are, you just simply place it into musical mode. If you don't know what the tempos are, you could actually define the tempos by going to your pool window and you'll see kind of all of the tempo information and you could also place it into musical mode directly right from there. So that's a quick way of kind of getting different audio files to automatically follow the tempo. Okay, so it says, uh, hi, Greg Tyler from Langley, BC, Canada, and just has a question about VST Connect. Uh, we had success with remote tracking, but when I try to get HD audio, it always loses connection, even if it records okay. Um, are there any common causes? Uh, VST's Performer and Connect have uh, Ethernet plugged into modem. So generally, you know, if it's... Um, you know, if you have the files, you could always, you know, it's going to be recorded as a FLAC file. Uh, but make sure that there's no additional firewalls on maybe the VST Connect performer and see where, you know, maybe have the performer save the files to a different location uh, and see that. Because when it does the, uh, you know, get HD audio, what it's going to do is basically take the rec the recorded audio files from the VST Connect performers, and this is only with the VST Connect Pro for those of you that don't have that only have VST Connect SE that comes with Cubase. So at that point, we could uh, then it will copy the files over. So maybe try to have the VST Connect performer record into a different location, a different hard drive, because that may be being held up with like uh, you know permissions or something like that. So I would try that. Okay. Uh, hi, Greg. I've just update Cubase from 7.5 to Pro 10.5. Have found out that some V collection uh, sense from Arteria crashes in 10.5 while it's working perfect in 7.5. Is there a way to fix it? Thanks. So you want to make sure when you are going through your, uh, if you go to your studio setup, uh, or sorry, your studio menu rather, to plug in collections. Uh, you want to make sure you'll, you'll see, I'm sorry, VST plugin manager, and you could click on the VST instruments, make sure that you're using the VST. I believe all the Arturia stuff is VST three. Uh, they're pretty good about that. So make sure that you have the VST three version. Make sure that you're also from 7.5 to 10.5. Uh, version Cubase 7.5 would allow you to run 32-bit VST plugins and around 9 or 9.5, it switched to only supporting 64-bit VST plugins. So you want to make sure that the 64, uh, that you're running preferably the VST3 version and a 64-bit. Um, and if you're not using those for other applications, you may want to not choose to install those, or you can make a plugin collection uh, where you could just not have the 32-bit or VST2 plugin. So 
often when plugins are installed, especially if you have VS, if you had we're going from 7.5, there's a good chance you have, that you have VST2 and 32-bit plugins. So try to just make sure that you use the VST3. And when you go to look at the instruments, like when you go to, uh, let's say we go click here and we say add VST instrument, you'll see these little three slashes here and that indicates that it's a VST3 instrument as opposed to VST2 instrument. So make sure you're on the VST3 and that it's the 64 bit. And sometimes if you have uh, like a bridging utility like JBridge, you may inadvertently be trying to load the 32 bit plugins which could cause problems. Okay, so, um, all right, my timeline just jumped. Let me jump way back. Okay, uh, so it says, hi, Greg, I would like to back up all of my settings, effects, instruments, groove agent workspaces uh, that I would later import, uh, paste into folders in into a new installation. I have Cubase 10.5, thanks in advance. So I think most of that will be covered in the profile manager. So what you could do, uh, if you wanted to carry over all of your user presets, like plugin presets, if user effects chains, different elements like that, you could go to your edit menu and go to profile manager and you could save a profile. So this would be all your key commands, your user presets, IO configurations. So try saving that as directly as a user profile and then you could load that into any other system, load the profile, restart the program, and then it will kind of work uh, as, you know, and all those settings I believe will be carried over for you. Okay. Okay, so um, in 10.5, where is the import execution button on import selected tracks? The window is too big for my screen. Could it be at the bottom? Tried resizing window, but it won't change size. Um, so we go to your import uh, tracks. So say if I go to my import uh, like tracks from project, and let me just select a particular project here. Um, so it can be kind of resized a little bit, uh, but I think I remember Taylor from one of your, um, you know, one of a screenshot you sent me on the sampler track that maybe you're running uh, kind of a low screen resolution. Um, so if you have the ability to maybe run, like the resolution I'm running everything at is a 1920 by 1080, you know, which is also known as a 1080p resolution um so if you if you see the different elements uh so you may want to try increasing your resolution on your computer if possible uh and then you'll be able to kind of see a lot more information comfortably uh but as soon as you come here and let's say we select uh, the project to import from you know if you can see all the settings here the okay will be kind of you know i think that's going to be automatically selected so if i just hit okay at this point it'll i just without having to physically click it i could just hit the enter key and that will import those particular tracks into the project so see if you could um you know increase your screen resolution or if you have the ability, if not, then just hit OK. Uh, just hit your Enter key uh, and the, or Return key, and then that should automatically have the you know import uh, and have the media and have the tracks automatically work and be placed into the project. Okay, so I just see a question, how do you mix correctly? You know, every project is gonna be slightly different. Uh, you wanna make sure that, you know, as you're mixing that you could hear all of the different elements uh, that they're kind of clear, you know, so, 
you know, this is a project I mixed a long time ago, like for a classical label. But, you know, make sure that as you work with this, you could adjust the volumes, but, you know, you could have 20 people mix the same song and it would all be correct. Um, some may be better than others, but, you know, it's kind of, a, you know, it could be, you know, it's, it could be very artistic. You know, it could be like, how do you paint correctly? How do you paint a portrait? How do you paint, you know, a picture correctly? So people would kind of take uh, different approaches to that and they could all be correct. So, but, you know, listen to a lot of different material, you know, listen to your mixes compared to other references in the same room, get to know what your speakers sound like. And sometimes, you know, it's really, you know, it, it's really hard sometimes in a DAW because you can, you know, spend so much time fixating on something. And, um, I remember I was, I was just uh, in a Facebook discussion with someone, a composer, uh, and it was like, oh, you know, I have a big deadline coming up. And I was like, well, if you didn't have a deadline, you'd probably never finish a song, you know? And he's like, yeah, you're absolutely right. We would just keep tinkering, around, tinkering away forever and ever. So at some point, you will get diminishing returns. Uh, so, you know, uh, make sure that as you're doing it, that you know you're not spending too much time and be confident what you're doing but you could always go back and make changes very easily so you know um but there's no real it's a hard question to uh give an answer for okay so we have a question how to quickly move an audio waveform to align with another track waveform without disturbing the other tracks aligned to guitar chord strums without re-recording so let's say if i wanted to so i'll just take this and let's say i think i will have bass parts here So if these were like slightly off in time, so let me just come here and let's say if I played these two. And now uh, if we listen to it. And let me just actually just nudge it ever so slightly. So I'll take this and we'll choose our start position and I'll just move it milliseconds here. So as we play. So we can hear that this is a little bit off. So what you could do is you could try uh, experimenting with the audio alignment. Um, so I could take that track as a reference and I could take this. Um, so I'll remove that and I'm gonna select this track and make that the target. And then I could just say align audio. And as we do that, now we can listen to it. It's just gonna shift. So without where they're slightly off and now where they're aligned. Where we were before. So check out the uh, audio alignment panel for your two guitar parts and that will probably do the trick for you uh, really easily. It's often used for background vocals as well. So if you have like, you know, six or if you have six or seven vocal tracks and the singer's getting tired and it's rhythmically off a little bit, you could just very easily align. Okay, just going through different comments. It's good. Um, so question, how do I turn Groove Agent into audio track? Um, so there's several different ways of doing it. So if I have, let me just see, I thought we had. A... So 
All right, so let's say I have a Groove Agent track here and I'll activate this project. So, you know, there's several different ways of doing it. So if I have this uh, information recorded uh, as MIDI information on the track, I could, uh, so I'll just record some of my Groove Agent parts in directly in. So I'll just come right over here. So now Groove Agent is sending the MIDI out into this particular track. So if I have that particular track, I could now select it and go to edit and choose to render in place. And that will just automatically, and there's different settings to include effects, uh, EQs, inserts, master effects. And that will just basically take that particular file here. I must have had it you know, go to the end of the recording here. And that will just turn it directly into an audio file uh, right in the system just that easily. So you could just do a render in place uh, for your MIDI track. Um, if you don't have it, if you have it just kind of running live, what you could do is as we have this particular track selected, um, I could right click and I want to add a group channel to the selected tracks. And now I could click on the plus sign and add an audio track. Uh, and I could say the input for this audio track is set from uh, group one. So we have the audio going to a group. The group, the output of the group's audio is now feeding the input. So if I wanted to record both uh, MIDI and audio simultaneously, I can just kind of hit play here and I'll hit record so we can see that the MIDI and the audio are being recorded at the same time so um, so that that's another method so you could do a render in place you could also select a particular file and go to export audio mix down and that could turn it into audio as well. Okay, so it says, uh, hi bro, please. I'm trying to upgrade from seven to 10.5, but the site is not taking me to right place to upgrade. What do I do to help please? Um, so I'm not sure where you are in the process. So basically when you do it, you know, you, uh, you know, go to this, if you're going to the Steinberg online shop, you could basically, you know, just do that and it will, uh, give you an e-licensor code. So, and it will probably show up in your, my Steinberg account, and then, uh, it will give you a download link, but there's also a utility called the Steinberg download assistant. So if I wanted to come directly to, uh, my Steinberg download assistant here, we could open this up and this is where you, you download the program. So this is the utility to download all of the different files and all the different programs. So you could go to the Cubase section here, select Cubase Pro 10.5 and you could do the full install. Um, so once you have the program installed, then you need to put the up, you will get a code that will update from your Cubase 7 to 10.5. Uh, do that, and then your update should uh, should work for you right away. So, uh, but it, maybe if you tell us where you're, what process, what part you're maybe stuck at, that could be helpful as well. All right. Okay, so just going through different questions. Um, all right, so you see Jonathan Brooker is happy you made a live hangout. I'm glad to have you on. Okay, uh, it says, hi, Greg. I seem to be having uh, trouble. Serum seems to be knocked, seems to knock my sound card in Cubase. 
Um, seems to knock out my sound card in Cubase. I've tried different settings, i.e. for my sound card. Uh, do you perhaps have a solution? Uh, many thanks, Mark in the UK. So if, you know, some sometimes you may load up an instrument that can take a lot of processing power. Uh, and what you may have to do at that point is just to maybe perhaps raise your buffer. So if you go to your studio menu to studio setup, uh, select your VST, your audio interface here under VST audio system and try going to your control panel and try raising the buffer and see if that helps. Um, so yeah, just definitely, you know, see to raise, see if you can raise the buffer and that will, the lower the buffer, the harder the computer has to work. Um, so as you're kind of, as you're working with that, you know, realize that if, and if you load in a monster instrument, that's taking a lot of your CPU, which I think serum is a pretty heavy instrument. I don't run it personally. Um, but you may have to raise the buffer up, especially kind of if you're adding it towards the later part of the latter part of a project. So try raising the buffer. And I think that may help you with that. Okay, so let's see. Um, sorry, I have like three computer mice to keep grabbing the wrong one. Okay. Um, Greg, is there a ripple delete feature like in Adobe Premiere? If I cut eight bars out in the middle, say a solo piano track, ripple delete pulls everything to the right in sync where the gap closes. So let's take a look at this. We can do this with the range selection tool. So let me get a project where you could see more parts here. So if I wanted to do it on a particular track, I could use a range selection tool on a track here. You could go to edit to range, and then you could just say delete time, and that will knock everything over. Uh, if you wanted to do this globally, you could hold control shift or command plus shift. Let me see if I get this right. And if I wanted to, then I could select, so control plus shift or command plus shift with the range selection tool. So use a range selection tool and then that will globally set the range. And then you could just, I think it's just shift X uh, or control command shift X and that will just delete that range of time. So, and if you do kind of global with the range selection, that will automatically carry over stuff that's in the tempo track and signature track as well. So select the range that you want to do the edit on, you know, hold down uh, control plus shift or con command plus shift. And then you could hit control or command shift plus X. And that will do what a lot of people call ripple edit. So All right, so we have Ruben from Miami using Cubase since 2000. Great to have you on a Hangout. Uh, so hi, Greg, I've just bought the 10.5 upgrade. What am I gaining from 10? What are your favorite updates? Tez from Liverpool in the UK. Um, so there's a lot of great things in 10.5. Um, so I think if we come over here that, you know, we see the colorized mixer channels. So that's something that a lot of people had wanted for a long time where the uh, color of the mixer channel is automatically carried over into the mix console. And that's just a preference that you can set up. So we'll go here to Cubase to preferences and under user interface, you'll see uh, track and mix console. So if you say you want the mix console channels, uh, colorized before they were just kind of like uh, more of a matte finish. So now I could have those uh, the colors uh, throughout the mixer channel as well once you kind of activate that. Um, I think that the some other really handy things is when we come over here to um, like one of the plugins is going to be uh, like probably the most comprehensive delay uh, ever conceived in the multi-tap delay. 
So you could have eight different taps and each tap could have its own plugins here. So if you wanted to kind of create feedback loop type of delays uh, and do like really ethereal sound design stuff, you're going to get uh, Pad Shop 2, which will give you a new oscillator. So if I say let's add a track instrument. So you can now drag and drop samples directly from Pad Shop uh, directly inside. So if we want to go open up pad shop at this point. Um, so if you have a sample, you could take, you know, any, uh, sample that you want and drag and drop it and be able to kind of do granular synthesis very easily with that, uh, for video handling, there's also going to be, uh, when we do export, uh, we can now export audio into the video. Uh, so we could, if we have a video file that's, let's say, the length of this project, but my part that I'm scoring to is only this long, we could also just, um, you know, have not the entire video file exported, but just a selected range. There's also a combination selection tool and range tool. So you could combine these two tools so you're not constantly switching. So if I want it to be a range tool, I could select at the top. If I want it to be uh, an object selection tool to move. So, you know, there's a lot of different great little things and you know, there's about 200 other features that uh, were in 10 to 10.5. Uh, I think one of the other ones, I'm not, I think this was in 10.5, but I, I could be mistaken, um, is going to be um, the channel EQ. So if I'm here on a particular track that I could just have, uh, let's say if I, I'm in my EQ window, um, let's say if I solo this track and okay, uh, but you could select another track, uh, let's say the vocal here. And at this point, um, you could just look at the EQ frequencies of another track. So if I wanted to now EQ the lead vocal and see the two of them, so, so that, there was, I think that was in 10.5, but it might have been in 10, but that's also a super handy feature, the comparison EQ. And, you know, just a bunch of other things. So there's a lot of great things from 10.5 uh, from 10. Those are some of my favorites. All right. So read through some more of the questions. I'll revert this because I like the song too much to let it play in its current state that I've destroyed. Um, so I see a question from Jonathan. I emailed you a question on Monday, Greg, about how to select more than eight mixed console configurations using key commands or macros. I uh, hope you received it. I don't think I've, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't remember getting it. So sorry if I missed it. Um, but let's take a look. I think we maybe uh, for the preferences, let's see if we go to our key commands and Take a look to see if there's a way to get additional visibility configurations. And so it looks like only eight are assignable via keyboard shortcuts. Um, I'll see if I could, uh, I know like for the markers, you could do kind of a, um, you know, navigate to marker X where you could type in, you know, you could trigger instantiate that key command and then type in marker 26 and it'll take you to there. But currently it looks like there's only eight that are addressable from keyboard shortcuts for uh, visibility. Sorry about that. Sorry if I missed your question from Monday. Okay, so from Pinder, what's the playback trick using locators to miss out the bars in between them and resume 
after the last locator without pause, for example, locator is on selection um, so that the cursor only plays A and C. So one little handy trick, uh, we see that we have like our range selection tool here. So it, when we get to the end of this particular range, what it'll do when the cycle is active, it'll just jump back and it gets to the end. This will just loop that portion over and over again. So if I wanted to skip a particular section just to try out maybe like a, an arrangement idea, what you could do is take your locators and if you go to your transport, um, you go to locators and there's uh, exchange left and right locators. So once the cycle is activated here, we'll play and when you see this in orange, what it'll do is skip that section. Up until now, that was overlord. I've got to choose. So that way, before you do like a big ripple edit, like we showed earlier, I mean, you could always undo that, but that's a way of making, of skipping sections. So it's really just when the left and right locators are reversed. Um, and while a cycle marker is turned on, then you could just kind of. And that will just skip that defined section. And I think it was 8.5 might have brought in where you could go to the transport and where you didn't have to and go to locators and just do an exchange. Uh, left and right locators, people would often get it backwards. And when they go to export a file, wonder why it wouldn't export, you know, because the ending was before the beginning. So, but I think that's what you're talking about, Pinder. Okay, um, so chord track question. Why is one of my notes within the chord dark blue? Uh, I have my event following the chord track. I understand the green, light blue, uh, and red coloring system. So let's go ahead and I'll just quickly add an instrument track here. Let's take our chord track. And I'm just gonna drag a couple of the chords down to the instrument track that we just made. So let me just. Okay, and as we look at different chords here, I'm gonna glue these together. Hold down the Alt or Option key and glue it all. So we see all of our parts here and we're going to colorize based on the chord track. Um, so, so the question is, uh, so th when we see these notes here, we can see that green notes are kind of within a chord. A red note is out of the chord and we see kind of a bluish note and I'm, I'm the worst with colors. Uh, that would be within the scale. So as we would just select particular notes here, you know, the color indicates, um, so, and I'm just saying, why is one of my notes within the chord track dark blue? Um, it says I have my events following the chord track, I understand the green, light blue, and, re and red coloring system. So I'm not sure, um, let's see if I move this to, so I, you know, I, if you, you have it based on a chord track and maybe is that note selected, but I'm not sure why it would, uh, I've never seen it be dark blue. Maybe if you could email me a screenshot, uh, if you send it to uh, club Cubase at steinberg.de. Uh, I could take a look at it, maybe get a better idea. But usually when we have the uh, coloring scheme set to chord track, you know, you only have three choices on last, but the, it could change depending on if the note is selected or not. So maybe it's something like that. Um, but if you could send a screenshot, that'd be wonderful. All right, so Chen Fufu just says, hello, Greg. Hi, thanks for being on a Hangout. 
Okay, so we have a question on Mac, my Mac, my Mackie, Huey, Wave, SoundGrid, Studio, Rack, Settings are not sticking. Stay every time I close Cubase 10.5 and open back up. Um, goes back to not connected. Um, so I'm not that familiar with the Wave sound grid. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of ignorant on that, but if I'm not sure if you're starting from a template. So if you have everything kind of set up, uh, you may want to try to save as template and give it a name and then open up that template. And then all the connections are generally kind of preserved within the template. Um, but I could do some more research on, but I'm not that familiar with wave sound grid. I know people are using it, um, but I'm not familiar how it, how it would be different, but try starting off and saving your setup that you currently have as a template. Um, okay. Let's move on. Okay, so he said, I see from Gareth. Good to see you on the Hangout, Gareth. Uh, hi, Greg. Question, in which functions in Cubase can the Elastic Pro audio settings be used? I understand these are the best quality resampling algorithms. Many thanks for the Hangout, as always. So generally, you know, what we could do is, you know, when we want to do time stretching or pitch shifting of your audio, this is when we could utilize kind of the Elastic algorithms. And these are a set of, like real time, almost kind of performance based algorithms. So if we wanted to just save this. So if we play back our audio in a project, we don't have to, it's not doing anything to the audio other than playing back the particular audio file. If I wanted to select, um, you know, different tracks here. So let's say I wanted to select my guitar and bass. And let's say as we do this, I wanted to transpose it, but not the drums and keep the same pitch. This is when we start employing the elastic algorithms, when we're modifying and changing the audio kind of in real time. Now, if I wanted to select all of the files, I could select all the files here and make sure that they're, they are in musical mode. So once I have these files selected, now as soon as I go and type in a new tempo, let's say 88 beats a minute from 100. Now the elastic is being employed or B144 or 108. So the elastic is really going to be only applied, you know, generally for like real time stretching and pitch shifting of audio. Um, so, and then there's also, it's used, uh, you know, some of the algorithms are kind of employed in connection, you know, in connection with very audio for doing pitch shifting and pitch detection as well. So that's kind of the different areas of the program where the Elastic Pro algorithms can uh, are utilized. Yep, see a comment. Still waiting for Antarctica Cubase users. You know, you know, after being home for several months, you know, it seems like a good place to be running Cubase. Uh, you probably have a lot of time for stuff, but I've never been there. Okay, all right, so we have people from Norway, Nebraska, from from Fremont, I believe. Nebraska, I believe that's how it's pronounced, or Fremont. Okay, so let's see, question. Hey, Greg, uh, about Cubase Pro last week. Is there any compensation as I just paid the full retail price? Hasn't arrived in the mail from my local retailer and kicking myself, I just missed a discount. You can maybe, you know, I, I'm not sure where you're based, but you know, maybe, uh, you know, you could work something out with your retailer. You tell them that you're just gonna return it if you haven't opened it. Um, so maybe you could return it and then purchase it from them at the discount. Uh, but, you know, it, the things, situations like that, you know, if you bought it from a retailer, really between you and the retailer, but you know, you could, 
see if you could, um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, if it's not open, some of the retailers will take it back. I, you know, it's worth a try, but you know, there's not an official thing that we could do at Steinberg once he bought from the retailer. Okay. All right. So we have people checking in, Gary checking in from Orlando and Oregon, beautiful part of the country here in the United States. Okay. All right, so people checking in from the Netherlands. Okay, so seeing a lot of people saying Friday is better. That's fine. Uh, so we see a question from Pinder. Uh, I'm finding when recording many guitars, I forget which guitar picks up. Uh, I used on which track. Uh, what, um, would you use the notepad or name the tracks uh, using abbreviations? What system? Uh do you use to keep organized? I think that the notepad is a, a great solution for this. So I think it's a really underutilized aspect of the program. I did a, it's one of these things I did a, a tutorial video kind of on notepads and people, you know, I think start using it a bit more, but here you can say, you know, it was, you know, Les Paul back pickup, you know, let's say, you know, Marshall, we want to say, you know, you could even take a picture of the amp if you want to. You could say, you know, SM57. You could say, you know, recorded to make guitar player happy. Other take much better. You know, so you could have fun and kind of leave notes and you can do this on each track. And when you go to like the full mix console view here, um, so we'll just kind of click here. We'll see where we could have our notepad data. So as soon as I kind of scroll over here, um, so at this point you could just see kind of all the notes that are in your data. And if you wanted to, you could have a overall project uh, notepad as well. So if you wanted just to go to your project, you could have like lyrics here. I often have lyrics kind of typed in. Um, and as we do this, uh, you can now choose to export notepad data and that will export it as um, just a text file. So when you open it up, you could have all those notes and all that information stored within a project. But for each track, um, I would use notepad data because uh, you get a lot more text and a lot more information, especially if you're handing off projects to others. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than getting a project to mix and you know, you have 60 lead vocal tracks and no one made a decision which one, which takes are the best and having you know, even like a simple track sheet like we used to see uh, on, you know, 24 track tape, you know, uh, boxes, you know, what trip, you know, the track information, this empty time code frame rate. Um, so I think I have a project where I kind of did, um, if we jump back to this particular one, you can see how I used the notepad in this particular project. So I'll just revert this quickly. So as I look at this, I could see kind of my main uh, notepad has all of the lyrics. So broken down, you know, intro, verse one. So if someone's, you know, if you need to even paste this into the score editor, you have the ability of doing that. And then as you look at the notepads, for different tracks, yeah, here you have copyright information, who the engineer was, what studio it's recorded at. So just so you could have an actual paper trail with the project that's off, you know, one of the things that's, you know, often so missing, especially. So here you could just see different notes that are being utilized in a notepad in the, um, directly in the mix console that's really helpful as well. Okay. OK. 
Okay, so it seems people want the hangouts are good for Fridays. It's good. No, just want to make sure it's uh, okay. So I see a question: How to automate a guitar with pedal in Cubase ten? Um, so you know, if you you know a lot of guitar pedals, if it's an actual physical pedal, won't necessarily. Um, you know, won't carry over, you know, it's, they're not automatable, but you know, obviously a lot of different guitar amps are. So if you wanted to, let's just jump back to here to this project and say, if I wanted to throw just a, uh, a pedal board on, let's say this guitar, So I'll just go to my inserts, and even if you wanted to go to uh, just the VST amp rack, so we'll go to distortion, and we could say, you know, uh, no amplifier, no cabinet, uh, and we just wanted to have our post effects. So if you just wanted to have. And then as you hit play, so let's say, okay, we're gonna jump right here. I click on the R and W. And now I jump back. All the changes are now just completely automated. So you know, if you wanted to just have, let's add another effect. So if you just want to, you know, throw in a wah wah, and again, just turn this on. And you could assign this to MIDI control as well. So you have like an expression pedal, and now everything that you just recorded, let go of the mouse. Is just automated. So the software pedals can be automated. Some guitar processors can be automated, but generally most effect guitar actual physical pedals don't have automation capabilities. So all right, so we have some someone from Kuala Lumpur checking in. Always wanted to go there. Um Okay, so question, oh yeah, does uh, Steinberg have plans to introduce uh, hardware using AVB network-based interfaces like PreSonus and others? Um, you know, so one of the things that we'll see, you know, because Yamaha and Steinberg are in the same family, so Yamaha owns Steinberg, and generally the, you know, we do a lot of stuff with Dante, and I think that Yamaha actually owns uh a, a chunk uh, of uh, Audinate, which which you know is has developed Dante, which is a network based system. So we can use you know all that use, utilizes um, you know different Dante systems. So there's different digital mixers. There's also the Nuendo IOs that have been out for five or six years. Um, so if you wanted a 16 channel audio interface or you wanted 16 channels of AES or eight channels of analog, eight channels of AES, uh, Yamaha kind of makes those. So I'm not sure if we'll see a Steinberg uh, branded AVB, but I, I think that more of the momentum in the industry is, is with Dante. Um, that's the most widely used uh, network audio protocol. And Yamaha already has, you know, it's probably the most widely, uh, you know, uses more Dante enabled, uh, you know, components than any other company. So we may, it may not be Steinberg branded, but, you know, and again, you could use whatever uh, interface you want. Uh, but there are a lot of Yamaha interfaces already that currently are, you know, network based. Okay. Okay, so just seeing a comment, uh, Terry Dean from Terry, uh, ordered my CC121 today. Can't wait. Yeah, it's a wonderful interface. You'll love it. So it's a great little controller. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, question, does anybody know how to automate a virtual guitar wah pedal in Cubase 10? So I think if we wanted to just take, so we just kind of showed how to do it, um, you know, how to automate the virtual wah pedal. Uh, but also if we added, let's say just a wah wah pedal here. So I'll just type in So like here's just a So here you could just say you want it to be modulation. And I think what you could do is just add a MIDI track and set the MIDI out to the Wawa MIDI in. And then you could just so I'm just using my modulation wheel. So I set my input to all MIDI inputs and the wah wah as the MIDI in on a MIDI track. And then you could use any just my modulation wheel. So that's all you have to do. Okay. Uh, question, is there a default key command to go to marker one and two? Uh, want, uh, want to keep number pad one and two set to the locators? Um, so let's see. Let's see what the current key command is. Let me just drop a couple markers in. So I'll go ahead and just drop. And let's take a look. I think it might be under markers. So I know, um, let me just do a quick search. All right, so we see the cycle markers here. Let me just see if there's. Okay, so we see two marker one. So it's just shift plus one. So one will take you to the left locator, two to the right locator. Shift one. Looks like shift one. Okay, so shift one on a QWERTY keyboard, shift two, shift three, four, five, six, that will allow you to navigate and to the different markers. So let me just make sure I got, yeah, so it's just gonna be shift and one and two on the, right above the, on the QWERTY keyboard, not the numeric keypad. So that will take you directly to markers one through nine, whatever you have set.
Okay, so uh, question from Robert. Hello, what's the best way to move score from Cubase to Dorco? What correction should be made in Cubase before moving to Dorco, like quantize, et cetera? So you could treat it, if you're doing it as a MIDI file, quantizing would make a difference, but let's come over here. But probably the, the most comprehensive way of doing it is going to be uh, once you're in the score editor. So let me just... So let's say if I come here, so once I have this kind of stuff in the score editor, it's just good to file to export. Uh, so once you are in the score editor and you want it kind of this layout to be uh, carried over, uh, probably the most comprehensive way, excuse me, I'm gonna sneeze here in just a second, um, is just to go to file to export music XML. So once you export a music XML, that would kind of carry over. Uh, that That's probably the most accurate way of if you spent time laying out the score, that's probably the most accurate way to get the score from Cubase directly into Dorco. Okay. Okay, so um, okay, so uh, let me just go through different questions. Uh, hi, Greg. Is there a way to split all the tracks at once and either remove bars or add bars? So just kind of like what we showed earlier. So I'm going to hold down Control or Command plus Shift and use the Range Selection tool. So if I hit uh, Command Shift X, that will delete that time. And if I wanted to put silent space there, we go to edit to range. And then there's um, where you could just choose uh, insert silence. So command option E, and that will just knock everything over uh, to the right, leaving you that silence. So select the range. And if you want to do this globally, control or command plus shift and use the range selection tool. And then control command plus shift plus x to delete or or, com or command con control plus shift plus e will add uh, silence in that particular selection range and if you wanted to just split all the tracks there if you need to do that uh it's just command shift it's just uh i think command shift Sorry, just shift X. So if you wanted to create a uh, you know, split based upon that, just hit shift X, and then that will split all the parts based upon the locators or the, the range selection. Okay. Okay. So, let's see, question. Hi, Greg. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Um, does musical mode work with matching vocal stem to different time signatures? For example, a pop song to reggae, jazz. Um, so, musical mode will allow you to basically speed up or slow down or change the pitch of the audio. Um, but it's not that, you know, and I think if you're doing jazz or reggae, that that's maybe like a different groove, you know, like we're, you know, certain beats are ahead or behind the beat. Um, so it's not really intended for that. You could go through and chop audio and, you know, maybe, you know, if, if you wanted to kind of chop audio, there's no kind of automatic way of doing that, but if you wanted to go through and very detailed, you can go into like audio warp and just kind of go to free warp and say, okay, I want this particular anchor here. 
I wanted this anchor here and now I wanted to move this event to kind of change the rhythmic feel of different parts. You could do that to get kind of a more swing if you need it. But, you know, ideally you'd want someone to uh, record with that particular groove that, that makes it so much easier. But, you know, really musical mode is to make sure that it's the timing that the, the projects can speed up and slow down and stay with it and match the project tempo or for changing the pitch. That's really kind of more the intention as opposed to this particular groove or, or that groove. You could do it, but it's not quite like just, you know, make it jazz, make it this, you know, because it'll each piece will have different... Um, all right, so let's go on. Um, so... A question from Sven. Uh, is there any chance of Steinberg releasing the fix for the Yukon visibility bug channels hidden in the mix console or not on the control surface? It's said it's been, um, it's said that there has been a fix for five years now. So I think, I know, I don't, I'm not sure if it's, uh, you know, sometimes with dealing with control surfaces, the channel visibility settings aren't carried and I haven't worked with a Yukon device in a long time. I used to do a lot of stuff with the system five MC like, you know, 15 years ago. Um, but I'm not sure if there, if that actually ever worked or if, you know, a lot of control surfaces don't manage like hidden tracks. They see all the tracks and they don't synchronize. Uh, and I know a lot of the, U so I'm not sure if that worked previously, um, but there's a lot of control surface protocols and I'm not, I haven't worked with Yukon in a long time, but a lot of control surface protocols don't take that into accommodation. And if the control surface protocol doesn't do it, we can't really fix it to make that, you know, control surface communication protocol see it. Uh, and I think with Yukon, a lot of the original developers, I don't think, you know, I'm not, you know, I used to work with those guys a lot and I, you know, I'm not sure if any of them are still involved with it. So, which is maybe why you don't see a lot of development with that, but I'm not sure if it, if it ever worked that way before and it's just a desired feature. Maybe if you could indicate that, um, but I could do some more research on it. If you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. Okay, so seeing more discussion about automating like the wah wah pedal. So again, yeah, it's not too hard to do. Just set up a MIDI track and set the output. Okay, my timeline jumped way ahead. Let me scroll back. Sorry about that. Thanks again for all the wonderful questions. Uh, and if you have learned something new, please feel free to uh, you know, give a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to the video. Uh, you subscribe to the channel. It's always helpful. And okay. So, okay. So I think I'm back to where I was. All right. Okay, I, I'm looking to upgrade uh, to 10 Pro to 10.5. Um, it just says, uh, I see there's an offer, but one price is $35. The upgrade is 145. Do you know what the difference is? So it could be maybe going from uh, Cubase Artist to Cubase Pro. Uh, but if you're, you're going from Cubase Pro to Cubase 10.5, it would probably be the around 35 pounds or 35 euros, uh, with the current promotion, I think. So, but it could be, if you go from, it might be, you know, there's updates when you kind of stay within Cubase Pro and you go from like nine, five to 10 or 10 to 10.5 within Pro, that that's less expensive than upgrading, which is going from like a Cubase Elements to Cubase Pro or Cubase Artist to Cubase Pro. So that might be like the Cubase Artist or Cubase Elements to Cubase Pro. Um, 
So, but I think if you have Cubase 10 Pro to 10.5 Pro, that 35 euros might be about right. But I, you know, when I look at the websites, I don't get to see the euro price because it's kind of geo targeted and I'm based in North America. All right. So we have Ambient Dave on a Hangout. Good to see you. Welcome. All right. So he's probably been on for an hour now. I'm so far behind. Okay. Okay, so we have a question. When I record within the MIDI editing window, the new notes are not visible until I close the window, use glue tool for new part, and then reopen editing window. Is it possible to change that? So let's say if I come here, I'll add an instrument track. Okay, so let's say I have a part here. I think um, just one little thing that you may want to do. So let's say if I have the part here and I'm in my editor, and then if I record, so let's say I just solo this particular track. So I'm gonna destroy it, all right. So now when, if I hit record, I don't see the MIDI data being written in until I stop. And then the MIDI data will be written directly in. Now, if I wanna see it as it's recording, you could actually click on this icon in the MIDI editor itself. So you could record directly in the MIDI editor. So now as I play and hit record. You'll see it. So try to, uh, just activate this little icon here for record in editor, and I think that may solve your problem. Okay. See Gareth helping out people, thank you for that. Just reading through different comments. Um, okay, so I see question. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, does link option supports a few instances of third-party plugins at the same time? I couldn't make it working with some IRs. Loader recently loaded on four different guitar tracks. Um, I believe that it does, so I'm not sure if I have any third-party plugins, um, but... You know, sometimes, you know, it could be more of an automated parameter. Uh, so let's come over here, let's say to the mix console and let me just delete that track. And I'll just add an audio track here. And I'll just load up, let's say, the uh, VST amp rack because it has a convolution reverb. So as soon as we go to the cabinet here, okay, so let's say we'll just do a, kind of a very voxy one. And I'm going to duplicate this track and duplicate that track. You may hear the Brady Bunch theme song in the background. My son has discovered the Brady Bunch and seems to be liking it. All right, so I'm gonna select these particular channels and I will set up my link here. So I will just uh, link these channels and I wanna make sure that I link the inserts here. So we'll just call this guitar link. So 
So I'm gonna switch the cabinets, let's say to a 212. And let's see if I come here. So it might be that it's only gonna take different parameters that are automatable for the link. Um, but if you could let me know which plugin it is. Um, but it generally I always had kind of good success with the link stuff, but you know, being that it's, you know, it could load up a WAV file in the background, uh, that some of those parameters by the plugin design may not work that way for being linked. Okay, so I see a question. Where do I find a noise gate in Cubase Pro 10? Um, so if you wanted to just go to inserts and under dynamics, um, you'll see gate here. So you have a noise gate right there. Also for every channel, you have a channel strip. Uh, and on the very left of the channel strip by default, you'll see gate settings. So you'll see like your EQ window here, go to your channel strip. Uh, and then you'll have a noise gate as part of the channel strip or just running it as a plugin. These are, in essence, the same controls. One will be in the channel strip, so it's always easily available, and one will be just a standard kind of using it as a plugin. All right, let's come over here. Okay, uh, why don't we bring back Reverb A from older versions of Cubase, the newer reverbs, I love them, but when I listen to tracks from back then I did, uh, that reverb is undefeated. Yeah, there's we saw some people, I think maybe it's, um, you know, and Reverb A was probably done oh, uh, maybe more than 20 years ago. Uh, so I'm not sure if the original developer who did it might not still be around in some of the code, maybe really stuck in older 32 bit. Um, but I, I agree that, you know, I know uh, the composer, famous composer, Harry Gregson Williams, that he loved Reverb A. I did a whole uh, project for Telarc where I used Reverb A and, you know, they, they kept asking me what hall I, you know, mixed, you know, that I, you know, used for the reverb. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of bring that back because sometimes, you know, someone in the middle of kind of a development cycle may have a little bit of time. So I'll kind of mention that, you know, people are asking for Reverb A to come back. But um, when I'd asked about it before, it was like, oh, that, that could be hard. It's kind of, you know, based on older code. But, you know, um, but I, I'll mention that again. So, but yeah, I, I like to Reverb A and used it a lot. All right, so just seeing a comment. Hi, Greg, greetings from London. Um, great cast as always, thank you. Uh, greetings, I miss going to London and traveling in general. Okay, uh, question, is there any way to store Media Bay results, uh, pane preferences, so it defaults to my preferred configuration? So let's say if I Jump over here to Media Bay. I think, let me just go to Loops. Um, and I think, is it this that maybe you wanted to see, to view? Um, I don't know of a way of saving that. Okay, I guess maybe we could save default columns. So let's say if I choose this, uh, like I want it to be category. I've never done this before. And let's say subcategory. And let's say um, plugin name, something like that. So if I click here, let's set this uh, set up uh, result.
right? So let's just say if I switch here to use defaults. So check out the little settings cog wheel here because it looks like you could set up defaults here. So you could just say, you know, I wanted to select none. I'll just not do that. But, you know, check out the little settings cog wheel there. And I think that you'll be able to um, have, have that kind of function the way you want. Okay, um, Okay. so is the question, uh, any tips on setting up Cubase in a looping jam mode when using VSTIs, external synths, and drum machines? Not so much to record, but looping using external controllers for different tracks, etc.? So, you know, there's lots of people kind of use Cubase as kind of like a jam tool, and it's probably maybe not the best project for that. So, you know, if you have this looped, Up into and let's say if I have an instrument track, okay. and I just wanted to, you know, if you have your stuff loaded up, you can say it's good too. And then, you know, you could just come right over here and play different tracks using the up and down arrow keys. You know, just drawing like a drum fill. So, um... But yeah, so I mean, using kind of, you could assign different keyboard shortcuts to go up or down or use the up and down arrows on your computer keyboard, which are pretty easy to navigate and just kind of play different parts. Um, but if I'm totally misunderstanding, just let me know if you wanted to approach it a different way, Gary. Okay. Okay, so it says, uh, question, I got your video about sending a Cubase session to Hangouts with sound from mics and Cubase. You are on a Mac, I'm on Windows. Both Cubase and Zoom demand exclusive control over the sound device. Yeah, you know, it breeds, it really is the same exact way because Cubase isn't, you know, in my setup, you know, and I get this question a lot uh, recently about, you know, setting up, how do I do the audio for my streams is, you know, just Cubase is talking to, I have a UR24C interface. So Cubase is talking to that, um, the audio out, the analog audio of that, and the microphone is going directly to, uh, it's like a Yamaha mixer with a USB output. Uh, this allows me, like if I have to sneeze or cough or talk to my son, uh, I could just hit the a mute button for the microphone, but the microphone there is combined with uh, the output from my UR24C, which is connected into my MacBook. Uh, and then the, you know, basically the, uh, like where I use OBS or Zoom, I just use, I tell Zoom to just use the audio from the mixer and it's not seeing... It's, it's not touching my UR24C. So even if Zoom requires exclusive control, um, it doesn't matter because you know Cubase and Zoom are both using different audio interfaces. And I found that to be the most reliable way. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, some people use plugins on the output, but I've done, you know, in the last four months, I've done plenty of live stream presentations and trainings. Uh, and it works pretty, f and it works, you know, flawlessly for me. And I don't have to do any like voice meter configurations. I don't have to worry about sample rate changes. I don't have to have a plugin instantiated onto every single project. So, um, so with less, it's, you know, really that how I have it set up, um, 
and I know my colleague John Barron, he uses instead of a mixer, he just uses two different Steinberg interfaces. And I think he does a loop back for the microphone. Um, so, you know, having two separate streams for the audio, I think works very well. So, um, so if you're on Mac or PC, it's the same principle. Okay. Okay. So question, how do I change background colors on editor windows from Taylor? Okay. So if we go to file, um, so if I come here and, and I look at the editor window, so if you go to file menu, it would say, I think it's edit, or we'll go to your preferences rather. Sorry, it's in. And we'll go to uh, color schemes under user interface. So you'll see kind of uh, editor area background. So if I wanted this to be brighter, I could just come here and you could have it kind of white like that or you could choose to just restore defaults. So at this point, uh, you could see the cycle region, the grid lines, but just come, um, so preferences to user interface to color schemes, and then you'll see editor area background, double click, or just click once, and then you could set the different colors directly there. Okay. All right, so I see Pablo admitted to dreaming of Cubase 11. That's good. I'm anxious to play with it around and check it out when it comes out. I usually have like a week to learn the whole thing. Okay, so I just see, hello, I some things about zero crossing. So maybe this is about kind of zero crossing and doing edits at zero crossing. So let's say if I'm here and I do a cut for my audio file, uh, let me just turn my snap off. And I wanted to split a particular audio file here. Um, as I do this, you may notice that, you know, when you have and edit, let's see if we can make this larger here. So ideally you'd want edits to occur right as the amplitude is at zero here. So that you don't have pops or clicks. So if I want to enable my zero crossing, snap to zero crossing, that when I do an edit now, it's only gonna allow me to cut at a zero crossing. But if that's turned off, I can freely cut anywhere. So, and the downside of freely cutting anywhere is if I moved this, you know, we may hear a little, a slight pop or click. So that's kind of what the, the intention of the zero uh, crossing function is when doing editing. All right, so the question came from Greece. Welcome to the Hangout. Okay, going through different questions. Thanks for all the great questions. Okay, so a question, say I have a fade at the end of an audio region and I resize it using the object selection, uh, normal sizing, what could I do to make the fade uh, out stay in place? Um, so basically the fade is, you know, the fade is tied to the particular event. So if I come here, um, let's say, let's see if this, so let's say if I split here and I do a fade, um, that fade is part of the event and not the file. So if I resize and I'll just put this into normal sizing. So I will go to the very bottom here, resize that. We'll notice that that fade will stay proportional. Um, what you could do, um, and I understand where at times you may want that fade to not move and to stay in the same spot, but we could think of this event here is changing size. Uh, what I've seen some people do is just kind of mark the cursor where the fade starts. Um, and 
you know, like with a marker. And then after doing that, just say, okay, this is where the fade should have been. And just hitting, I think if you just hit A uh, on the event, um, you know, where the cursor is, that you could just do a fades to range. So if I go, if I select just the end of a part and, you know, if I, I think if I just select with the range tool here, uh, and so if you hit a, you could just have like the fade out go automatically to like that range there. So you could do a fades to range, but the, as you move, uh, the fades that you have will move along with it because it's, you're moving the part and the fade is part of the part and not the audio file itself. Um, I think if you also, if you're doing with the fade handles, but I think if we grab this and let's say if I just go to processes and say fade out. And I will just go, we'll just say new version. So now that we've done that, we have that fade. And so that fade is kind of hard written into the audio file itself. And then as we adjust, the fade remains the same. So if you're doing the handles, think of the handles as being part of the container. Uh, but if you do kind of a hard process that that is going to be tied to the event and then you could adjust the start and end time. So you may want to do different fades for different scenarios. I just see a comment. It's amazing how Cubase's built-in EQ has improved. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always been kind of a really wonderful EQ to start with. Uh, I know many engineers, it's their favorite EQ that they use and just kind of get exactly what they need very quickly. And I see uh, just a comment. Uh, my next experiment is to mix and master a track using only Cubase plugins. So including the instruments. So yeah, you could definitely come up with amazing results. And I think, you know, I've seen a lot of people just kind of shy away from using a lot of third party plugins and doing it with kind of the included tools that come with Cubase. Okay, uh, so I see a question. Can I degrade the sample rate of a specific track to 1000 Hertz looking to get an underwater effect uh, kind of filtering, just removing the high end completely like Drake? Um, so if you want to do something like that, you could, let's say if I just want to do it on my vocal. So, you know, some people will do like extreme EQs, but if you wanted to do uh, another Thing that you might want to check out is going to be, um, let me see, the, like a Bit Crusher plugin. So sometimes, <laughs> so you know, you can play with Bit Crusher to kind of get lower stuff, but uh, other people will just also come in here and just choose to. Uh, you know, grab even like a studio EQ or frequency. Uh, sometimes, you know, even a DJ EQ could work well for this. So let's say if I want to do maybe like a whole track or instead of just, um, just a vocal. Sorry about this. You know, so I've seen some people, you know, just do kind of drastic EQ for effects, but check out like the DJ EQ, uh, I think. You wouldn't mind. Up into so it's just. That was okay. So long. I was so naive. Okay. 
So I'm not sure like if there's any particular Drake track, but if you want to send me a link, I could probably tell you how they do it. I know they do a lot of stuff in Cubase. Um, so, um, but yeah, you know, there's different EQ techniques um, as well. So, okay, so we have a question. Thanks, Greg. Uh, mixed console question. So I thought maybe to ask for Steinberg to add ability to select more uh, then eight mixed console configurations. Yeah. All right. So we discussed that already. Thanks. I'll mention that. Okay. Okay. So just say, um, so seeing discussions, uh, maybe some kind of modulation would make the sound more interesting. Uh, something a few years ago I did not use it more now and, and if frequency could be integrated as it's done with compressors uh, three to choose okay so I think uh, because in case of the same EQ studio EQ one is frequency okay so I think more discussion on the built-in channel EQ okay Okay, so see more discussion on sample rate dropping. Okay, um, so just seeing uh, auto compression of instruments when a vocal back starting up, maybe is a question. So let's say if I want to take, um, you know, to do like a side chain EQ, so I could take kind of all the tracks here and I'm going to select all the tracks except the vocal and I'm going to add a group channel to these. And let's go ahead and I'll just put the compressor on. So go to my dynamics and we'll just use kind of the standard compressor. And let's do side chain and we'll base this on Andrea's vocal track. So now as we do this, and this will be kind of an extreme example. So I sent all the tracks except for the vocal to a bus. And as Andrea's vocals come in, let me just make sure this is down volume wise. So let me just see if those are all kind of feeding, but that's really all you'd have to do is, um, and you may be able to even, let's come over here. And I'll just check the routing, but it's really just kind of normal. A side chaining so let me just so I have kind of different groups here but you know so that's really all you'd have to do is let me see if I could just do it quickly just on the master bus since I have a bunch of groups that are already set up already in the project Right. And let's check this out. We played our records into the night. Um, so I may have to send it up, but that's how you could basically just kind of set up the vocal as um you know a side chain input to have the air tracks kind of go down uh, you can play around doing a little more uh routing but that's the basic concept OK, 
Okay, so I see a question. When I go to pool window and activate musical mode, why do some of the events get pushed forward out of place? Um, so it could be that when you have the pool window here um, and you active, it says, and you activate musical mode, um, it could be that the tempo information, the tempo value that you have for that particular audio track isn't accurate. Um, that would be the first thing I would look at to make sure that your tempo uh, information here. I know a lot of people may record a band uh, and then they leave it at default at 120 beats a minute and the band isn't recorded at 120 beats a minute and then they activate musical mode and it's looking for kind of an accurate tempo value to use. Uh, and if that tempo value is not uh, in the ballpark, it's just kind of a random number. That's when different events may get shifted around. So uh, make sure you have the correct tempo value. Okay, so it says uh, I have a MIDI piano track and I want to know if you can make the chord track read the MIDI piano part to insert the chords to the chord track. Yeah, so we'll show you how you could do that. Okay, so let's say I have... Uh, just come here, so it's a piano part. Uh, we look at it in our score editor. So just kind of a typical piano part. So what you wanna do is go to your project menu, go to chord track and just say create chord symbol. So even if you don't have a chord track, we can now just come right over here, say create chord symbols. I generally leave the first two checked, but it depends on the part. And now it's created the chord track and all the chords from the piano uh, were extracted and determined and laid into the chord track. And if I have my score editor selected, I could also just go to advanced layout and say show chord track. And now all the chords will be inserted directly into the score. Uh, so I see question, can you create um, custom scales for the chord track? So let's see if we come here. That there's a way of So let me just see if I do a new project and start with a chord track. Okay, so I'll just click to add my custom scale. So if I double click here, See if there is. So I'm going to deactivate automatic scales. So I think if you choose no scale, then you could come over here. So there's kind of different scales. If you're on blue scale, oriental, Japanese, so there's a number of different scales. Uh, yeah, so if you want it pentatonic and you want it to be G, you could have that set up. So there's different scales here within the uh, custom scales within the chord track. So you can play around with that. All right, so I see question, is it possible when creating a MIDI track, uh, have modulation, expression, automation, tracks, auto activate and be set to a specific value? Okay, so if I have a MIDI track here, uh, 
I think what a lot of what he's, one thing that's helped out a lot of people is when you come here, you could have a MIDI controller. So you could say like on this track and you can save it within your template. I want my modulation to be at 80. Uh, I want, um, let's say my main volume to be at 100 and I want expression to start at 64. So, and then this will, as you hit play, kind of send those different uh, parameters out to the track as you hit play. So you can have kind of a default uh, setting for different MIDI CCs. So experiment using the MIDI controller, MIDI plugin. You know, you could obviously have it stored within your MIDI track as well, but you know, this might be a quick, easy way, if, especially if you work with templates, just to kind of start with a known um, so kind of with a known entity. Okay. So we have someone checking in from Ireland. Uh, so you see workspaces are not saved in a profile, Greg, according to my experiences. Um, so, um, so I think maybe if uh, you may want to check to see if um, I don't have to restart my Cubase, but it could be that, uh, and I'll check if you want to email me after, but it may be that global workspaces are saved, but uh, project workspaces aren't. Um, and sometimes workspaces can be very determined upon like screen resolution. So that could be a factor, but I, I could play around with it, but I don't want to necessarily have to restart my Cubase three or four times to, to do it. But if you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de, I'd be happy to uh, play, a little, play around with it more, but see if it makes a difference for global workspaces versus project workspaces. Okay, so we have a question. How do you send several tracks to a group channel as opposed to having to select each one by one uh, and rerouting them? Okay, so let's say if I'll come here and I'll add, let's say, eight audio tracks. So if I have these selected, I could right click and you want to say add track and cut over to the right. And let's say add group channel to selected channels. So as soon as I come right over here, so add track, add group channel to selected channels, hit add track, our group is added and they are now all routed to this particular group. Um, so if I wanted to just look at the routing uh, for that, we can see that that's going to route one to group one rather as I move down to different tracks, they're all, we could check all of their routings are all being set to group one. So again, select your multiple tracks, right click, add track, add effects channel or add group channel or add VCA fader to the selected tracks. And that's a quick, easy way of doing it. You could also, if I added another group track, so let's just say I wanted to add a group track here um, and I'll just call this. Okay, so we'll add our group. So we have our second group here. Uh, and if I wanted to take all these tracks in route, at this point I could hold down Alt or Option plus Shift and for all the selected channels, they'll now all be routed to group two as you could see. So those are two easy ways to send multiple tracks to a group track destination. All right, so I'm from High Point, North Carolina. All right, that's great. Okay, question. This is a real basic question, but I have not figured out how to get my Yamaha Mo X F8 as a VST that I can pull. Um, I could pull from the media bay. I did steps that I was told, but it only shows up in the editor. So I'm not sure if it's going to show up in the media bay. Um, so I think I may actually have, let's go to my VST instruments here. Um, so I think if I add my external instrument, I'll just drag this over. 
uh, I don't have it. I don't have one connected. So we'll get that little message. Um, so I don't think you'll, you'll, I think you'll have to select all the patches from here. Um, just because it's, you know, it's more of an editor function as opposed to that, but let's go ahead and give it a, a test and it's, it could be done, but probably the people that did the editor maybe didn't include it. So let's say if I wanted to go to media, uh, and let's, okay. So well, it looks like it is there. So, um, so when I come over here, let's add a track. We'll say under external. So let's say I have my, and I just downloaded the Mo XF8, XF, XF6 editor. We choose that. Okay. So we'll get our message because I don't have one connected, but it looks like I could just come over here to media and say, okay, I want to go to my Mo XF and then, okay, I want to look for my acoustic pianos. I want to look for uh, acoustic guitar and all of my presets will just show up there. So if I just kind of drag it out to a particular track, we could just do that. And then that would load up our plucked chords in a preset directly from there. So it looks like that kind of works as I would expect. Okay, so I see a question, uh, how to change MIDI files to Dorian or Phrygian. Um, so if you wanted to take a MIDI file and transpose to different modes, uh, there's a couple easy ways of doing that. So let me just add a quick instrument track. Okay, so I will just So I will just quickly put in a C major or just a scale. Okay, so we have this in our editor. So we have C major scale uh, over two octaves. Okay, so we have that. And um, so let's say so we have those different notes inputted, and if I wanted to transpose this, what I could do is you could choose to, you know, we'll, I'll just select all the notes here um, and go to MIDI and go to transpose setup. And then you can say, I want it to be, uh, I want to do scale correction. So let's say we'll knock that to zero. Uh, I want it to be to, instead of C major, I want the new scale to be C Phrygian and hit OK and you'll see those notes change accordingly or again select all the notes go to MIDI to transpose setup and so is Phrygian and Dorian so you can now come right over here so you have all these different scales that you could automatically convert to so now it's going to be C Dorian and all the notes would just uh, go directly to a C Dorian scale. So you can take any MIDI part and just do its transpose setup uh, under MIDI, transpose setup, and you'll have scale correction and you have all these different scales to work with. Okay, just seeing a comment, Cubase is the best. I think it's pretty cool, so. Um, and someone just mentioned below, uh, been using it for over 13 years now. And Ted mentioned no DAW uh, even comes close. So I don't work with the R1, so I'm not sure. But I think Cubase is pretty special. I could be biased, though. Yeah, just seeing a comment, uh, Steinberg should change the name to Cubase first because they've been first in all the important features. I think you could say Steinberg is a pretty innovative company. Kind of defines the feature sets for, uh, for the industry in a lot of ways.
Okay, so um, so this may be just kind of reiteration of what we had before, but let's say, um, you know, have the backing track. So let's say if I have piano and vocal on a particular track, so let's say if that's all I have, let me activate this project and you want it to duck. So let's say we have the grand and So if I wanted the piano to automatically duck, I could just come right over here. Let's put a compressor, you know, and we could actually just do it directly here in the channel strip. So just... So you could do it there or just run it as a plugin. So let's just show you as a plugin. And you can do this with any of the VST3 plugins quite easily. So now I want it this side chain to be coming from the vocal. So as we play. Sure, it's on the right track here. Let me check my send here. comes in you should hear the piano just get side chain so once again just kind of set the side chain um, you know the compressor on one and then have the vocal just be the side chain input and you should be all set Okay, just going through comments. Thanks for all the great questions. Okay, so I see uh, hi, are there any plans to easily switch between offline processing and insert plugins? So let's say if I have a number of plugins as inserts here. So let's say I go to my mix console, uh, I click to inserts. So let's just say, so I wanted a delay. Let's do some EQ. And let's say I want to do, let's say chorus. So let's say if I have a number of different inserts on a particular project, I could select um, let's say if I go to my F7, so we go to audio to my direct offline processing. One thing that a lot of people miss is the ability to just, is where you could just take the actual, uh, inserts here and just drop them into the direct offline processing. And then I'll just take the whole vocal and it would automatically just render all of those plugins directly on your system. And then if you wanted to, you could just choose to bypass the inserts and this way they're rendered. 
to the particular files. So that's an easy way of just taking your inserts and integrating it with the direct offline processing. And then, you know, at, at any time later, you can just say delete all, and that will go through and go right back to the original. And then you could just turn that on and your inserts will be processing in real time or be rendered very quickly. Just see a comment. It's kind of interesting. Germany is so behind in arts, but Steinberg and native instruments. We are almost proud. I think German culture should be proud of what Steinberg and other companies have done. Uh, so just see a uh, question. Never heard of Dante. I uh, wish there were more content on it. Google it. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's tons of content on Dante, and you could even go through, you know, I've gone through. Dante level three certification. So you could get trained on it online. So all sorts of great stuff and a lot of resources on Dante originally kind of developed more in live sound. So you wouldn't have to, you know, carry huge snakes, you know, the way 18,000 pounds and you just kind of send all of the audio directly over one single ethernet cable. Um, and now for like a lot of installations and facilities, you know, you can tie it directly into like a typical uh, IT networking and just using standard Ethernet cables to transmit large numbers of uh, networked audio. So Dante is very popular. Uh, it's not as popular maybe in recording circles and to have the functionality, you know, adding a Dante component onto a peripheral, you know, it could be a little expensive. Uh, but you know, it works very well and it's kind of a becoming quickly if, you know, it's pretty much the industry standard for live sound and facility based stuff and it'll be, it'll migrate into recording as well. Okay, so uh, we see, hi, Greg. After changing tempo BPM, it also changes the vocal recording pitch and speed. What is the way to avoid that? Um, it could depend upon which algorithm you have set up. So let's say um, I'll jump back to this project here. So there's different algorithms. And one of the algorithms that you're going to have is tape. So um, Elastic Pro Tape. So I oh, didn't like that. Bear with me just a second. See if I get my Cubase to wake up. If not, I may have to reboot my computer really quickly. Okay, I'm just gonna reboot my computer. Sometimes it comes back, but it takes a little while with the setup. So uh, just bear with me, I'll be back in like two minutes. Uh, and I'll just reboot and then I'll show the, t the tape. So just kind of hang out just for a couple minutes here. All right. So I think we'll be, we're, we'll be coming back here. Let me just check. Okay, so I'm just gonna check audio real quick. Okay, so uh, so we got a question, uh, sorry about that. Uh, question after changing tempo BPM, it also changes the vocal uh, recording and pitch and speed. Is there a way to avoid that? So if I wanted to come here and we'll select all of these files 
And if I switch the algorithm um, in, let's say, the pool window here, so usually kind of see it here. Let me just. So I'll switch the algorithm to, if you have it set to tape for all these files, as I change down, if I change the tempo, so you can hear it. So as we play and I slow down the tempo, the pitch changes and this is mimicking like an analog tape machine. So it could be that we have and if you have one track, if these are all set to kind of elastic time, and let's say the bass track is set to tape. So now when I slow down the tempo, because this is in tape, the bass will change pitch. And be off. So you could easily, and our way to check it is to just go into your pool window and as you kind of slide over, you could see kind of the uh, algorithm that's gonna be used as well. So if you kind of slide this over and make sure that these are all set to time or, or pitch as opposed to tape. Okay, so let's move on. Thanks for bearing with my computer issue there. Okay. Okay, so we see uh, how to routing elements inside Groove Agent on a dedicated audio bus. Um, so if you want like, you know, dedicated outputs, All right, so if I'm here, just slow this down a little bit. All right, and if I wanted these to go to dedicated output buses, so right now I will come here and let me just hide my input channels. So right now everything is being sent to one stereo output. But if I wanted to split these to different outputs, I can now, if you click here at the top, I can say, let's go to our kit mix. And I can say, let's go to output two for my snare or for my kick. And I want my snare to go to output three, my hi-hat to output four, and let's say output five for the room and I'll put six for overheads or let's say I'll just switch those. So now we could have each of these different tracks kind of going to different buses if we wanted to. And we could just increase And this way you could have different, uh, you know, third party plugins and be able to access just kind of that easily. And if I recorded some of my parts, um, so say as we come here, and then, so I'll stop the internal sequencer, I'll just come here and let's just do uh, render in place. And now each of the different 
elements will be kind of automatically mapped to like overheads, room, hi-hat, snare, and kick. So it's easy ways to kind of, you know, get your, uh, you know, the audio from Groove Agent to different buses, different outputs to different audio tracks. Okay, so can time signature change in the middle of the song? Yes. So it's a question. So let's say if I have my time signature here, uh, I could start off, um, let's say, 4-4. Four, four. I come here. Let's make it 7-8. And let's say 3-4. Back to 4-4. Four, four. So at this point, it could just automatically change and you may have to just activate that the tempo track. So it may just, in so now as we do this and I put in my metronome. So in three, four, and then back to four, four. And if you wanted to change like the click patterns, you could also just come here and say, I wanted to do like two plus five. I wanted the three, four to go to this editor. So let's maybe, so as we listen to this, you could change the metronome as you want, or if you want three plus four or four plus three. Now we're back to four four. So, so those are so you could definitely have uh, different time signature changes, no problem. Uh, so I just see kind of a question. Uh, can anyone tell me useful shortcuts? Uh, uh, LOL. I know a few, but want to learn more. I think that, you know, the best thing, you know, one of the, you know, best pieces of advice that I can maybe pass on is to make yourself learn, like learn a new keyboard shortcut into your muscle memory. Learn, if you learn one new one a day, you know, that will save you so much time and just learn that one keyboard shortcut. And then as you do something, if you find yourself going to a menu a lot or to a particular function, you know, just figure out, you know, you know, if you find yourself doing something over and over again, and you think, oh, this, this could be better. Learn that keyboard shortcut and ingrain it and get it into. So it's just kind of ingrained muscle memory. So when you want to do that function, you're just going to hit that key combination. And if you do that, you know, I could, I could show you, I could tell and share a number of keyboard shortcuts, but it may not be applicable to your workflow. But try to learn one new keyboard shortcut every day. And over a month, that's 30, you know, let's say 30 keyboard shortcuts. In two months, it's 60 keyboard shortcuts. That, you know, if you knew, if you learned 60 new keyboard shortcuts in two months, you know, and you incorporated them into your workflow, you'd be saving a lot of time. So, you know, figure out exactly what you want to do. Um, so, and then, you know, but really like just learning the keyboard shortcuts is really important. Okay. Just see a comment. If Beethoven was still composing, he'd be using Cubase. I'd like to think that Bach would too. Um, but yeah, it, it, it would be amazing what, you know, how prolific those guys would be with a tool like Cubase. Um, okay. I guess my voice is going to be soothing ambient Dave to sleep. So it works well with my son too. I read him Harry Potter before going to bed and he'll be knocked right out. Okay. Uh, so question, Hey Greg, when I bring in MIDI files, it automatically launches Halion, which is okay, but it's impossible to delete Halion after it's loaded from MIDI. I've tried everything, but have to hide any tips. Um, so, you know, if you import a MIDI file, it, you know, it, 
there's a preference. So as soon as you come over here, you could just say, uh, if you go to preferences to MIDI to MIDI file, uh, and here you have destination. So you could just have it, if you want to switch it in the future to do MIDI tracks or to do instrument tracks and, as opposed to the Howling and Sonic SE multi-timbral, you could do that. But it, once you have those tracks in, you know, all you have to do is, you know, there, it's an instrument track. So you could, at this point, you know, just right click and at this point, just remove selected tracks. So let's say if I have a, a pad shop instrument here. So and I go to my racks over here, I can see pad shop loaded up. So it, when I right click here, I could just remove selected tracks. And then that instrument is automatically unloaded. So if I want to unload this groove agent, which I just added, I could select both of them and remove selected tracks. And then that will allow it to disappear. Okay. I see Gareth is being really nice and sharing some of his favorite keyboard shortcuts. He has some good ones there. Okay, so we see question, is there a way to freeze more than one track at once? The freezing is kind of set up for you know, like one track at a time, but you know, you may, if that's something that you want to do, you may want to just look at doing maybe the render in place functionality. So let's say if I have multiple instrument tracks or multiple audio tracks. Just get this project open here. You know, and you have a lot of flexibility, especially with, um, you know, so let's say if I wanted to freeze, uh, you know, these parts here, like these two parts, so I'll select these parts here and then I'll just go to edit to render in place. And there's different settings that you could have. So, uh, I could have a dry, I could have channel settings, like, which would be like inserts, EQs, channel strip. I could have the, uh, add the, um, add this send effects or the complete signal path. So if I just wanted to come here and say, let's just render it. So instead of freezing multiple tracks, I just do a render in place. Uh, you could have it automatically disable a track. You could have the tracks automatically muted. It's just going to be placed directly below. In this instance, I had it muted. And then that way you have your audio and your MIDI and you could do, you know, MIDI virtual instruments, external MIDI instruments, if it's configured, audio, all frozen directly, just like that. So instead of freezing, you know, check out the render in place. Um, you know, it could do quite a bit. Okay, just reading through comments. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, hit my off button so I could cough. Okay. Okay, so, um, I think my timeline jumped. Bear with me. Let's sneak back. All right, just finding my place where I was. 
Okay, I may have lost a couple questions. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so I see uh, just question, what is Yukon? Um, Yukon is a control protocol. Um, so uh, you know, like we have Mackie control protocol, which is kind of a language for controllers to work. So Yukon was originally developed by, you know, in con between Steinberg and Euphonics. Um, so if you have like, a, and Euphonics was acquired by Avid. So, but here we could have, so if you have like an artist series or let's say Euphonics System 5 console that would use the Yukon protocol to be able to communicate uh, for control surface functionality. Okay, so um, so it's just it's kind of like a different protocol language, like Mackie control or Huey control. Okay, sorry, I lost some questions during my last scroll there. Okay, so just reading. Um, all right, so uh, just seeing a comment uh, from Pablo says, I did not change it for anything. I just hope they improve it. I think it's about IC Pro. Uh, Greg has told me in Hangout, could it be Greg that uh, IC Pro getting better? I, I think the team is working on it. They've obviously you know, been working a lot on getting Cubasis 3, you know, did a major upgrade with that and brought it out for Android. So um, I think that, you know, they, they might have some resources that have freed up, but I was, you know, supposed to go to kind of get a sense uh, of all development going on in March, but that trip got canceled with uh, coronavirus. Okay, so I kind of missed a bunch of the meetings where I could learn some of that stuff. Okay, just reading through different comments. Um, so I just see, does anyone know the LCC2 error? I have a problem with this. Um, a lot of times, uh, like an LCC2 error could be related to the e-licensor. So sometimes um, going through and reinstalling the e-licensor could often resolve that. All right. So I was seeing uh, just comment from Gareth, uh, zero crossing, another revelation. All right. So we're, I'm always happy when I could teach Gareth a new trick uh, on a Hangout. Makes me feel like I did my job. Okay. Okay, so I see that Ambient Dave probably checked out a while ago, but he's going to bed. He has a busy day. Thanks for joining us on the Hangout, Ambient Dave. Okay, just... Okay, so it seems like um, just some weird discussions going on. Um, okay, so uh, it says, hey, Greg. Um, uh, do I pan uh, from the piano roll just a certain part of the melody? Um so, you know, front of piano roll, if you have, so say if I wanted to pan 
uh, from, from a piano roll, you could just draw in, um, you know, for, for non, for traditional MIDI instruments and most VST instruments, you could have just a MIDI CC 10 that would do panning. If it's a VST three, five instrument, something like Kalyan or something like that, all you had to do is just, you could double click and you go to the expression editor um, and you could go to note expression and then you could have each note uh, have its own panning as well. So if you wanted to have independent panning per note, but that would require like a VST 3.5 instrument. Um, so, but you know, just setting up your MIDI CC 10, you could pan individual notes. Okay. Um, Okay, so question, can we see multiple audio files simultaneously on the audio editor so it is easy to align vocals? Vocal DT, I know there's auto aligning Cubase, but I'm still using 9.5. So I think this is in, this might be in 9.5 or 10 when this was introduced. Um, so let me just see if I still have the project open from the drums. Okay, so if I wanted to come here, um, I could select like, let's say my kick and snare and I'm gonna put these to different colors so we could differentiate these. So let's say I'll make so I will just kind of double click here in the sample editor. And if I have both of them selected, you have this little function where you can say show all selected events. So I could say this is I'm looking at my kick drum, you know, this this particular track here. And then if I have the kick and snare selected, clicking there, I could see both of them. And then you could do editing and see the other one as a reference behind it. So that's a really handy tool for editing, you know, parts rhythmically against another part. Okay. Uh, so I see question, how do I download Cubase? It won't work for me. So you'll need to uh, purchase a license and uh, maybe uh, and perhaps an e-licensor key. So you should, uh, if you want to do that, um, then you should be able to download your Cubase, but it's not a free download. So you probably have to purchase it and get a license for that. Okay. All right, so just seeing a comment. Hello, much love from India. Okay. Okay, so lots of odd comments from Lil Rocky. All right. All right, just reading through comments. Okay, so just uh, seeing calls for a moderator in the comments. So hopefully, uh, usually it's kind of pretty good you know, we don't have the need for it but um all right but yeah it's, it's not helpful to clog up chat and spam um okay 
Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so we see, hey Greg, can you find out uh, what chords are in the Japanese scale? So I think if we just go to our chord track here, let's add a chord track. And we'll show, so let's say within So I'll disable that. So we go within our, we'll say our Japanese scale. I don't know off the top of my head. So let's say Japanese one. So this will show you, so it looks like a minor second. Um, so that, that will show you there for a C Japanese one scale and a Japanese two scale. We'll have a, a major second. Uh, it looks like a, the perfect fourth. So that's what the different functions uh, notes are there. Okay, so I see a uh, question, which version of Cubase is this please? Um, it's, we're running Cubase Pro 10.5. Okay, so I see a question. Hi, Greg. When using several MIDI tracks grouped uh, in a group folder, deleting a particular note will delete it on all the events uh, of the tracks, but trying to insert a note will only insert it on the first track of the group. Um, this is a major problem I've been having for a long time. Is it a bug or am I making some bad mistake? And if it's a bug, could you please report it to Steinberg? Thanks for your work. So let's say if I have, um, let me add some MIDI tracks here. Let me just add some instrument tracks. Okay, so let's just go delete these and let's say um, if I have these in a folder track. Okay, so I think let's say if we have these on group editing. Okay, oh, well, just come over here. Let's... Okay, so, um, so it says when uh, the tracks are grouped in a folder, deleting a particular note will delete it. Okay, so let me just delete this note there. And let's say if I'm adding notes. All right, so let's see if I... So it looks like when the group editing is enabled that you can add the notes.
So it looks like the group editing, once the group editing is on the folder, that adding and deleting the notes is working across the different folders. Um, but if if I'm misunderstanding, please uh, send me an email to Club Cubase at steinberg.de and I can pass it up the chain. All right, so just saying all sorts of need for moderation. Uh, so I'll do some research and see if there's ways of doing moderation so we don't have someone just uh, going on and coming up with new profiles and trolling. All right. Okay, so I'll look into see if we could do uh, some moderators because uh, we haven't had really need to have a moderator before, but it looks like today we do. All right, so we'll just kind of keep going. We'll try to move through a lot of unnecessary spam. Okay, uh, so I see Greg, is it possible to paint the velocity but only of the selected MIDI notes while not messing with the rest of the notes? I find it a quick method to paint the velocity uh, instead of click clicking. So one method that you could do if you have, let's say a number of notes here. And I want it to only like adjust the velocity of the selected notes. Uh, at this point, you could, you know, just kind of adjust the velocity of the selected notes, even if there's other notes. And if you wanted to be able to, you know, scale, move up or down or compress, you could adjust that, um, but you could also probably just uh, create a logical editor condition where you could say, um, we want to take value to, you know, if you wanted to increase the selected notes, you could say add 20, um, and then you could say types are equal to note. Um, we could say, you know, and we could say property is event is selected. And now you could say just uh, take, you know, notes that are selected and increase their velocity by 20. Um, but I think, you know, to kind of just paint in, I don't think that... Yeah, so if I just kind of paint this in, it will automatically just, um, you know, do all the notes and not just the selected notes. But, you know, try, if you have the selected notes, try just to go in the center here and then you can, uh, that way, increase or decrease or scale the velocities uh, accordingly. Um, so you see question I wanted to ask about the algorithms to vary audio. How do you compare it to, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you compare it to Melodyne in use and com 
and effective tuning of vocals, not the T-Pain thing, just regular uh, vocal adjustments. I think kind of the integration that you have is going to be, you know, pretty special. I, you know, I think it's pretty unique how tightly integrated uh, the that you'll have when working uh, with with the very audio. And I think that you know, while Meldine's improved with the ARA too in integration, that when you actually start, you know, getting into working with the different uh, integration of very audio and the fact that it has kind of its own unlimited undo and redo and the same, you know, basic functions for, you know, so if we wanted to come over here, let's just bounce the selection quickly. Um, so as we do, you know, the integration here, you know, being able to still tie it into your undo history to be able to integrate it with the chord track. And, you know, I think sonically, uh, you know, they both hold up and they do very well. You know, we've had many, many, many projects where all the tuning for significant projects were done in very audio, but, you know, being able to, you know, quickly take this and, you know, have that automatically cue to be able to see the colors based upon, the actual, you know, scales from the chord track is also pretty unique. So you could do, you know, wonderful vocal tuning with the very audio. So I haven't really felt the need to really do tuning uh, in in Melodyne since I since very audio was integrated. I think with very audio three that was uh, brought in with uh, Cubase ten, the, the, there's the workflow significantly improved as well. Okay. Um, so I see question, any Q basis for iPad live sessions like this planned? Um, we, we could look in, I could look into doing it. Um, you know, it's a pretty lab, <clears throat> it's a pretty elaborate setup to work, uh, with multiple audio interfaces on the, uh, you know, on my laptop to make this work. So I'm not sure if that would translate as easily to an iPad environment. Um, but I, I could pass along, um, and see and do some research on that. So, Okay, reading through lots of spam. Sorry, I get to miss this in real time. Usually we have people behave a little better. And just seeing a comment from Agent K. Sorry, I can't, don't know how to pronounce your last name of your, the last word in your name. Uh, direct offline processing is great for us with slow PCs. Sorry, keep hitting the microphone with it. Okay, so just. Okay, so I see. Uh, is there any plan with Cubasis Importer to gain compatibility with Nuendo or does it work already? So Nuendo can open up Cubase projects. So I don't think it's going to. Uh, I don't think it's an issue because it could just simply, um, you know, open up the .cpr files. Okay, so I see a uh, question. I created a folder for drums, but suddenly the bass drum disappeared. So let's take a look at an example here. So 
So say if I have all these drums, uh, they're currently in a folder, so I'll drag them out. So, you know, sometimes the easiest way is just to select uh, and then just to do right click and move selected tracks to new folder. And that will be, you know, sometimes I know people that, let's, let's say if we undo that, that a lot of tracks, you know, people may uh, have a folder track. And then they may drag it into a, a folder and then maybe it goes above or it's very small. But, you know, in the future, you could just try to select all your drums, right click and move selected tracks to new folder. And one thing to also to check is you'll see visibility here. Um, so if you look in the left hand side, of this particular project, sorry, let me activate this. Um, you can see visibility and make sure that um, like those particular tracks are visible because you could hide tracks just like that. Um, so I see guys, I know Greg explained it. Uh, do you know why changing the tempo does not change the locators or the event? Um, it could depend on, so let's say if I have uh, a marker track. So let's say I have markers here and marker tracks themselves can be in musical or linear mode. So as soon as I have the marker track here, if it's set to linear mode, as I change tempos, the marker track. So let's say if I change it to 60 BPM, the marker track, uh, when it will stay at the same exact time position when it's in musical mode, but when or when it's in linear mode, but when it's in musical mode, uh, the markers will stay the same. So at this point, if I jump to 100 BPM, the markers will re keep their same position. So marker tracks themselves can be in musical or linear mode. All right, my timeline jumped here. Okay, just navigating still, so lots of spam in today's today's chat sessions. I apologize for all the attendees that have to sit through that. Okay, so I see question I have everything right, but I must have touched something in the preferences. I take a few minutes to eat something in return. Okay, so I think this is going back to the markers. Okay, uh, so I see a question from Michael Dean. Can I buy the USB license dongle via Amazon and then buy Cubase Pro 10.5 as it's coming from a different DAW and not I'm not used to this? Yeah, you could do that or you could buy it. You know, your e-license are often, 
You know, I know in the United States where I live, the dealers have them. Uh, so the ones that are open have them. A lot of people get on Amazon. A lot of people, uh, you know, can get it at stores. You could also, if you order it, you can order it from the Steinberg online shop, depending on your country. But, you know, Amazon is a very popular place to get uh, the USB e-licensor, and then you'll be all set. Okay, let's move on. Just reading through comments. Uh, so just to see a question, is there any video about how to set up the Studio Pass? So I think the Studio Pass still needs to be updated to work with the later versions of uh, the VST Connect. So look for that pretty soon. Okay, uh, question, when using samples from Cubase in another DAW after a mix down, are, they, uh, are there any legal stumbling blocks that may occur? No, all the content that comes with Cubase is license free, so you don't have to worry about you know, someone coming back later and saying you owe them, you, know, you got a hit song, you're lucky enough to get a hit song, and now you have to give all the royalties because you used a loop um, for a particular you know, in a particular project. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so I see, uh, how about a quick toot on how MIDI notes can automatically merge together? Okay, so it's just a new project. And this is often could be set up quickly with the MIDI, uh, with the MIDI record mode. So let's just add a quick instrument track here. So let's do a quick Kali and Sonic SE. Okay, so if you want to merge different notes, you could go to your different MIDI record modes. So you could have it automatically, like when you're doing linear or cycled recording, do new parts to have it merge. You could mix or stacked. So if you wanted to, you know, if, if it's during recording, So let's say I do like a two bar recording here. So I'll just kind of do, so if I have my MIDI record mode, let's say I'm in cycle uh, and I have it do new parts, as soon as I hit play here, um, let me just start and, and let's say the next time, So now when we do this, we see this kind of indication of where we see kind of it looks like multiple parts are kind of stacked on top of each other. So if we pull these aside, each pass that we did was automatically recorded into different t takes that are stacked on top of each other, like so. So now if we wanted, if I wanted to merge those, uh, I could just grab the glue tool and hold down alt or option and click. And now all of them will be in one nice contiguous part merged together. Um, now you could also set up your record mode. So if I was in cycle record mode uh, and we could do this from here or from the transport menu, I could just choose to merge. So as I record, I can play high notes here. 
and then and since it's in merge for the record mode all of those notes will now be merged into one single part so that's a quick uh, overview and some of the merging functions I, I hope that made sense okay Okay, so question, can we automate zooming and zooming out with shortcuts? So you could do G and H. So the H will allow us to zoom in, to zoom out, G. And if you hold Shift G, Shift H, you could zoom horizontally and vertically with G and H and zoom, zoom vertically in and out using Shift plus G and H. So it's a great keyboard shortcut. It's right in the middle of the keyboard because it's often used so much for QBA session. Okay, so hey Greg, uh, question. When I uh, create an effects channel, the plugin doesn't automatically open up anymore since 10.5 to update, I believe, is there a setting to let that happen? So usually by default, when I add, if you add an effects channel track, so we'll just come right over here. So let's just add. Okay, so we'll just add an effects channel. So let's say if I had a reverence, do that and it's gonna open up. Um, so there is a preference to change that behavior. So if you go to file, or let's say you go to your preferences, and I think it's going to be under editing. Uh, let's see, maybe it's under VST. Okay, so if you go to VST to plugins, there's a preference here that's open effect editor, editor after, after loading it. So now with that disabled, I go to add an effects channel track. And we do this and it doesn't open. So try going to preferences to VST to plugins and enable or check open effect editor after loading it and hit okay. Okay, uh, hi Greg, when configuring BeatStep Pro, which includes sequencers, how should it be configured using MIDI clock or MMC? where to configure for transport sequencing and pads to work. Um, so I think the beat step pros that I think maybe in Arturia, I'm not that familiar with it, but you know, I'm sure that it's going to synchronize usually MIDI machine control. Um, yeah, is not used as commonly because, uh, for devices for like for drum machines or sequencers. So you'd probably go to your transport uh, and go to your project synchronization setup and you'd see destinations and you'd probably, wherever you have the BeatStep Pro, and it, I assume that it probably has a USB driver, just activate that you want the MIDI clock destination to be out to that device and have BeatStep Pro. Uh, then you could activate external sync, hit play, and then the two will be in sync with each other. Okay. All right, so seeing someone else had a comment just on velocities of selected notes. Let me try with a modifier key and see if that makes a difference. So I'll just select those notes and let me just draw in so it does it with all of the notes try all right so let me just
see this is one of those situations where Greg gets to learn something. So let's say, um, select these two notes. I'm just gonna hold down shift. All right, let me try just doing a quick chord track and this will allow me to easily just get some block chords in. Okay, so let's say if I have just these bottom notes selected and hold down the shift key. So it looks like uh, this is where Greg gets to learn something new. Um, so if all, if you have these chords selected and you, so if I hold down, if I just go through All right, so those are all down, and let me just select this note here. I'm gonna hold down. So it looks like if you just used a pencil tool, that the selected notes will only be affected here, and not the other notes. So, um, so well, it's not the paint tool, so, but yeah, that's where Greg gets to learn something today. Okay. Okay, so good to see Miller down to hang out. Okay. Okay, so I was just seeing question. Hi, Greg. I have uh, Cubase 6.5. I just received an email for Steinberg for updating to Cubase 10.5 for $159. Sounds great, but it says update, uh, not upgrade. What's the difference? Are there? Uh, is it the? Is it the full thing? So generally, the terminology is an update. Is if you have your Cubase 6.5. At that point, I believe it, you know, there was like Elements Artist or maybe Elements Studio and then just blank Cubase. There's three different levels of Cubase. So like the latest versions we have here are Elements, uh, Artist, and Pro. So an upgrade is going up one of the levels. So an upgrade is going from a Cubase Elements to Cubase Artist or Cubase Elements to Cubase Pro. An update is when you're in kind of the same tier, like the upper tier, like Cubase, or within the same tier. So if you are, want to upgrade from Cubase Elements 6.5 to Cubase Elements 10.5, that's an update. Or if you're going from Cubase 6.5 to Cubase Pro 10.5, that's an update. So going from a lower tier program, a lesser, you know, of the three tiers, to an to a more advanced tier is an upgrade staying within the same tier but going to a later version is an update so yeah and it's a great it's a great promotion please you know take advantage of it Um, so just saying, hi, Greg Steinberg has a recent promotion. Uh, do you think a developing music producer has a real gain, uh, in this, uh, direction to upgrade to Nuendo? Thanks, Greg. You're a wonder. Thank you for the kind words. Um, I think when you go, you know, Nuendo is going to have all the features that Cubase currently has. Um, so, with Nuendo, the release of Nuendo 10.3, they incorporated all the Cubase 10.5 features. 
Um, if you're doing music stuff, I would say that Cubase is, you know, way more than sufficient. You know, it works for Hans Zimmer and Junkie XL. Um, so if you're a composer, you're doing music production, I think Cubase has all the other tools. Where Nuendo shines is when you get into other types of projects. Uh, when you want to get into game audio, when you're getting into you know, doing sound effects in Foley and doing ADR. If you're doing reconforming, you're doing network collaboration, you're doing Dolby Atmos. You need to, you know, intelligently rename 10,000 audio files from spreadsheets and be able to extract that information. You need to do like sound design functionality for like randomizers, uh, for you have, you know, where you could have a plugin that does random elements. So there's lots of, you know, ad more advanced and maybe more facility production features that could come in Nuendo. And depending on your work, you know, if that's one of those things that you do a couple of times a year and you get a lot of money for delivering that particular work, you know, Nuendo is worth it. But if you're just doing music, I think Cubase would have everything that you really need. And, you know, so there's a, the Cubase promotion is currently going on. That's also very attractive as well. So, you know, you could also, you know, and if you're still not sure if those are features that really work for you, you know, download the trial version of Nuendo and, you know, try it out for 30 days and see if it make if those features make a difference for your workflow. So for a lot of people, it's just essential things that they do at their job every single day. And it makes a world of difference. A lot of people doing music can probably do almost everything inside of Cubase. But, you know, read up more and try the, you know, download the trial version and see if it makes sense for your workflow. Okay. Okay, so just seeing a comment from uh, Pablo that his Cubase situation just solved itself. Um, it, it's my karmic presence on a Hangout. So, all right, my timeline jumped. Okay, just going back to our timeline. Seems like the chat has gotten a little more under control. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, so it's just see a feature request. Can we get the option to right-click tracks and uh, then have the option uh, to send a folder with a list of the folder tracks to select from? Uh, yeah, I think that, that would make sense, so I'll pass that along. Okay. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, forgive me if you've, uh, you, if you've probably covered this, but can you show how to auto gradient the colors of new tracks? So if you want to uh, have the tracks automatically colored, um, a, a handy preference would be to set, uh, so we'll go to your preferences and then under uh, event, I think under user interface, tracks and uh, mix console channel colors. So if we just say use tracks default color and let's say I, I add an audio track, it'll show up gray, which is kind of boring. Um, what I have it set to in mine is to uh, use previous track color plus one. So now when I go to add tracks and let's say I add six tracks, they'll automatically be colored and they'll just uh, add the next color to the subsequent track. So uh, once again, go to your preferences and go to use previous track uh, and go to track and mix console channel colors and just choose to use uh, previous track color plus one. That's what I like to have set up. So.
Okay. Um, so it says, hi, Greg, when zooming out in the project window, is there a way to prevent Cubase from centering the view position? I find it shifts the view to needless information when zooming. Okay, so let's just come over here. Um, let me jump to Okay, so let's just say if I, so I, okay, so I see where like as we go to a particular area here and zoom out using the keyboard shortcuts that then, so let's say if I jump my song position here to this marker and I hit H, that, that kind of turns into the center. Um, another way of doing zooming so that it won't necessarily do it at the center, I think if we just kind of come here and we move the cursor to the top, at that point, you could just kind of navigate and zoom at the same time. So it's not with a keyboard shortcut, um, but this is like when I'm working, how I do most of my zooming uh, really quickly. So I just kind of instigate it here from the top, uh, move the cursor, and then just hold the left mouse button down and move it up or down. And then I could zoom and just maintain the same position. But I know it's, um, so, so try that as a zoom method. Uh, but if you come over here and then hit H, looks like that will kind of center it for you, which, which I could see makes sense because that's what you're kind of focusing on. But try just uh, zooming, you know, here, and that won't recenter that position just by zooming like that. Okay. Just reading through comments. Nice to see the chat field kind of back to normal. I appreciate it. Um, so I just see a question, does Steinberg have any vocal loop packs for sale to add to the media bay? I know some of the, uh, there's not one that's kind of dedicated for different vocal loops. Uh, some of the different libraries that are there have some vocal loops, but nothing that's where it's the primary focus. Okay, uh, just saying comment, Greg, excuse me, please move the mouse slower, not so erratic, because it's difficult to follow it. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to get through as many questions. I see it's a huge list of questions, so I'll try to go a little slower. Sorry about that. Um, so just see, uh, Greg, excuse me, please. Uh, so sorry, Greg, uh, zooming in and out, uh, when I've zoomed in, there's, is there a one key press to zoom out to the last position? So one of the things that you do, if you used a zoom tool, there, there could be two different things. So we have a dedicated zoom tool. So if I wanted to look at that, you could double click and then go back to where you were. So you say, oh, we want to see what's going on there. Double click with the zoom tool anywhere. So I want to see just that, double click, and you can go back. Now there's also 
a little function called memzap. Uh, let's see if I could do just a keyboard. I think we may have to activate a keyboard shortcut for this. So let's go to our key commands. or zoom zap. Okay, let me assign a keyboard shortcut to this. Let's see if that one is available. Okay, so if I'm here, and let's say I zoom, I think that might do it, but there's also, I see just kind of a, uh, keyboard shortcuts for undo zoom. Let me just remove this keyboard shortcut. So say if I do that and then hit the keyboard shortcut. Yeah, so if you could undo the zoom through a user definable keyboard shortcut. So go to your key commands. So it looks like, uh, and then there's just an undo zoom. So once you kind of zoomed in here, hit that and you're right back to where you were. Okay, um, so I see Greg, how do I copy all of the effects and settings and processing that I have? Um, uh, so settings and processing, but I have a Groove Agent 5 from Cubase 9.5 to project on Cubase 10.5. Um, so one of the things is, let's say if you have a lot of different processing going on, so, you know, it's just going to reread this, make sure. I'm understanding. Let me get Groove Agent loaded up. Okay, so, and let's say, so um, how do I copy all the effects and settings and processing? I have a Groove Agent 5 from Cubase 9.5 project uh, to, so, it, you know, your project should automatically load up with all the same settings from Cubase 9.5. So I don't think you have to copy um, the effects and settings, but if you had like a lot of external effects and settings, um, what you could do is just simply, you know, come right over here, you know, so you, your 9.5 project will load into 10.5. So you shouldn't have any issues with that. But if I wanted to, you know, you could also, let's say if I had, you know, multiple outputs configured, you know, et cetera. So if you go to your input output channels, you know, you should be able to have all that. And something that you could do that was introduced in 10, if you have a lot of different settings, is you could right click here and you could say export uh, mixer and effects to Cubase. Um, and that will automatically take all of the settings that you have in the mixer with all the effects and effect sends. And, and drop that right into the Cubase mixer in case you needed to run, like change the reverb to a third party plugin or something like that. OK. 
Okay, so did you see? All right, so did you see? Question: uh, Can I create a? Just put this into musical mode. Um, so let's see, uh, can I create a two bar loop then on another track solo for multiple bars over the repeating two bar loop then play back like a complete song? So, let me just see if, I think there's a quick function in the MIDI editor, so let's, We just drag this, say I have just two bars of this loop. And I'll just render it real quick. So just to make sure it's clean. So I think, you know, it doesn't, you know, with the MIDI editor, you could have like in what's called an independent track loop. Um, but what I would do, and I know this may not be uh, the exact solution that you want, you know, but you could just, you know, come right over here. And if you just drag the edge out, um, you know, go to the right edge here of this particular part, um, you can now just copy it kind of ad nauseum that quickly. Um, and then that way you have kind of a more of a linear, but I know within the MIDI editor, there's kind of like an internal loop, but it's not, it's a little clumsy. I would say it's not as elegant, but you know, you could just drag that out forever and then just, you know, record over that, the live thing and not worry about trying to coalesce the, non-linear and linear together. Okay. Just reading through comments. Um, so just see a question. Uh, Greg, is it true that you would be called for Cubase help from celebrity producers like Michael Jackson's team and others back in the days? So yeah, I get a lot of calls to help people out. So I, I think it was one of Michael Jackson's last sessions. Uh, I got a call from my friend Daryl Pearson who was working with him in Ireland and I got a call at like three in the morning and they wanted to, um, they had a project and I think it was at uh, 122 beats a minute and Michael, and they're ready to mix and Michael wanted it suddenly at 113 beats a minute and they couldn't figure out an easy way to do it and this maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and I just told him to, you know, enter the tempo, put it in musical mode and change to, you know, change it and hit play, you know, and then, you know, just do it. And, you know, they were just floored. It was like 73 tracks of audio and nothing else could do it, um, at the time. So I got, you know, I got to help out Michael Jackson session with that. So, you know, it could have been one of his last sessions and he got on the phone and told me, thank you. So I was very appreciative for that, but I've gotten to help out most of my boyhood heroes, um, but you know, it's, it, it's always weird. Sometimes, you know, my calls will be, you know, some big hip hop star. And then, you know, the next call two minutes later is Donny Osmond, you know, so it, it's interesting, but you know, um, so I've gotten to help a lot of people and it's, it's, it's a thrill, you know, for the people that inspired me to get into my career, you know, that I help them set up their studios and just hang out and, you know, get to know them. So but yeah, I've gotten to help a lot of interesting people over the years, so it's been great. Okay. OK, 
Okay, just reading through comments. Okay, we're doing okay on time. Uh, so I see, hi Greg, on a CC121, can the uh, scroll knobs be used for browsing presets as well as the AI knob? I don't think so, but I think you might be able to set the, um, there are two user function, you know, there's four user function keys. So the AI knob, you can do it as kind of, you could lock it, it could be a jog wheel, it could be a scrub wheel, it could be an AI knob, but I don't think it allows you, I don't have it hooked up to my computer that I'm on now. Um, but I don't believe it allows you to scroll through, but I just, I've gotten very used to just using kind of the up down keys on my computer keyboard, and that's worked out really well. Okay. Okay, let me see. I may actually be caught up with the timeline. Uh, okay, I know we had a couple people that had sent questions and I think one of the questions might be kind of groove agent related. So let me take a look at this uh, from John. And I think he maybe had a pattern where where when working with Groove Agent that the outputs um, for like snare and rim shot let's see if there's so where the snare and rim shot were going out of the same uh, output. Um, so you could easily separate the outputs for each pad in a beat agent kit. Um, but if it's gonna be set up with a kit, um, like an acoustic agent kit, the output routing that we see here is gonna be defined kind of by the kit creator. So this way, like all the hi-hats will be kind of going out of the same source. So it could be that your snare and rim shot, depending on a kit that you're using, especially if it's an acoustic agent kit, will kind of be physically tied to the same outputs by the design of this of the sound designer. So if I come here, probably my, let's just go back and see if I, So since it's coming from the same source, the rim shot probably can't be separated by design. Um, and if you really needed to, you could, you know, render it to a different file if you needed to process it differently. But it's kind of like, it, you know, simulating the concept of, you know, it's generally the uh, snare is the source and the source will, you know, that way the same processing that's going on in snare, like in the real world would be going on for the rim shot as well. Okay. Let me just go back to one of the, our questions that was mailed in. Okay, so we had a, a question um, about how to make the uh, like the color of the preferences window dark. Uh, that someone that saw in one of uh, Dom Segalis's videos. Um, so, and it's this is really just kind of a Mac setting. So when you go to your preferences, and there may be like a dark mode on Windows. Uh, I haven't looked for it. So we can see here that this is going to be, when we do this, this will be kind of very white. Um, but I think if we go to your system preferences and under general, you could switch it to a dark mode. And now when you go to like your Cubase preferences, uh, at this point, the you could have kind of dark backgrounds. So uh, and different windows as you pull up different functions. So let's say if you get your audio connections, you know, some of these windows will be 
uh, set up. And that's just a, a system preference on Mac that allows you to do that. All right. All right, let me just jump back to my live feed and we'll see how we're doing. Sorry for keep hitting my microphone with the head, with my headphones. Okay. Uh, so I just see a comment on, uh, it's probably with the Michael Jackson story. So it was uh, Bruce Wedeen or Quincy involved. At that point, I think it was uh, Rodney Jerkins and Daryl Pearson. Uh, and I also helped him, I think, you know, with uh, with Teddy Riley once, uh, kind of before he passed. He was, I think he was doing some work with Teddy, uh, who's a longtime friend of mine. I've known for 20 years or so. Um, so... Um, but uh, Bruce and Quincy weren't involved at that time. And then after that's when, you know, I think after Quincy, you know, Teddy was brought in after Quincy. So, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so I just see I'm not getting any solution. Please help. Tempo is changing automatically. So, you know, if your tempo is changing automatically, it could be that, you know, you have tempo changes. So, you know, if you open up a tempo track, you could, you know, see if you open up a tempo track and if it visually has tempo changes in it. Now, you could have... if. Cubase is set with the tempo track disabled. Cubase will play back a steady tempo. So we have tempo changes, but Cubase isn't following it. So you could try to disable your tempo track. And now if I turn this on, Cubase is gonna speed up and slow down to match the tempo. So if we come here. So you could do different stuff like that, where that will then follow uh, the the different tempo changes. So if your tempo is changing, you know, open up the tempo editor. And I think you could also just hit uh, Command or Control T and see kind of a full screen tempo editor, or you could empo, open a tempo track there. Okay, so maybe I just kind of missed this question. So let's say, um, okay, so from Gareth, is, sorry for repeating, Greg. Sorry if I missed it. Uh, is there a way to stop the range moving when changing tempo track? Um, so let's say if I have this range select, if I have a range selected here, we just add a couple of tracks. Okay, so let me just drop in a couple of samples here. All right, let's put these in musical mode real quick. All right. Okay, so make sure I'm understanding. So it says, uh, is there a way to stop the range moving when changing tempo? All right. All 
right? So say if I have the range selected here, let's say around these events, and then I just, okay, so I can see the range adjusting based on my tempo changed there. And let me just see if my switch this to seconds, if that does the same, yeah. So I'm going to set the, let's say if I set the range now and I have these in musical mode and I adjust the tempo. So if it's in linear mode, the range looks like it's staying the same, but if the tracks are in musical mode, So now I'll select these two. And now we see that the range is setting. So it could depend on what is behind the range. So now the range is adjusting with the tempo. And once in linear mode, select the same range for those events, adjust the tempo. Now the range is moving, but the events are moving with it. So, uh, um, so it, let me know if that makes sense. Uh, so just see question, uh, I won't be surprised to know how many celeb artists are subscribed to Greg's Hangout. A lot of times they just call me or email me with questions. Like after the last hangout, I got a question from Hans Zimmer's team and setting up a controller thing. So I was able to help them out with that. Okay, I've got a couple more minutes left. Okay, um, hi Greg, is there a way to input tempo by tapping on mouse or keyboard keys? So if you go to your project menu and go to beat calculator, um, so at this point you could just do tap tempo and just hit your space bar and that will give you a BPM. Uh, once you have that determined, you could say, put that at the tempo, at the tempo track start or at the selection start. So just uh, project to beat calculator. Okay. Uh, so I see comment uh, or question when rendering in place, can a naming scheme be set up that's uh, less confusing for a newly made audio file to automatically be named stereo out by default and not the name file by track? So it can depend. It's a little, I agree with you. Uh, it depends. Like if you do a render in place without dry, it'll maintain the the track name. But if you do it through like the complete signal path at that point, uh, it will just, just carry, it will be named stereo out R often. So I brought that to the attention, uh, before. So, but I don't think that there is a particular naming scheme automatically. So I think if you choose the complete signal path that at that point, if you choose dry, it'll maintain the track name. But I think maybe channel settings complete, the other three will automatically, um, will automatically kind of carry over. So I don't think that there's a, a naming scheme like we see in some of the other aspects.
All right. So we let me see if there's other quick questions. We'll get wrapped up here in just a minute. All right, just going through. We'll see if we get wrapped up. Okay. Um, okay, I'm not sure if you showed this, but can you set up a recording input chain? Um, some people like effects and auto tune and stuff when they're recording. Hopefully, I didn't miss the question. Thank you. So all you have to do is, you know, if you want to set up a recording chain, is you can go to your inputs here, and um, you know, from the inputs here, you could place different uh, plugins. Realize that some plugins may cause latency, and that latency could be kind of thrown off, could throw off someone's performance, um, you know, because sometimes. You know, if you're doing like a multi-band compressor and pitch shifting, you know, the, you know, and there's some of the pitch shifting plugins will work in kind of a real time mode or have a lower latency mode. So, but just, you can put any of the plugins directly on, uh, if you want to embed it into the file itself, put on input channel. If you wanted to monitor with it, make sure that you're not in direct monitoring and you could have it on a track itself. But either way, sometimes the effects can impose latency. Uh, and some of the audio interfaces, like the Steinberg UR and AXR interfaces, have built-in DSP, so you could monitor with reverb without latency. You could monitor and print compression and EQ and different guitar amps without latency because the, it's built into the DSP of the unit itself. So... All right, just going through. Um, all right, so we're about three hours and 56 minutes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. We're going to start our holiday weekend here in the United States. Uh, look for our next Hangout on Monday. Um, so I have a personal thing I need to be doing on Tuesday, so look for that on Monday. We'll get the announcement posted uh, on the channel as well as different Facebook groups. Uh, if you have questions, you can please send them in advance to Club Cubase at Steinberg um, at uh, Steinberg.de. Um, so you could, you know, if something's a little more involved, you could send that in advance. Uh, I want everyone to please stay safe and healthy. I apologize. I know we had kind of uh, bizarre spamming and looks like someone was going through with multiple identities, posting goofy comments and hitting the, uh, thumbs down button. So I, I apologize. I know it's a little annoying. I'll look into see if there's any way of moderating it, but obviously the person had kind of multiple, um, identities going on at once. So, you know, apparently, you know, maybe they're a little bored. Um, but I apologize. I know it's probably annoying for the viewers. Uh, so I'll see if there's any form of moderation. Usually it hasn't been a problem. Maybe it'll be just a one-time thing. But I'll see what we could do. I want everyone to have a wonderful weekend. Uh, and we'll see you on Monday. And uh, thanks. It's been a thrill just helping people throughout the whole world. Uh, have a great day and look for the index later tonight. Thank you so much. Goodbye.